Okay, folks. Good afternoon and welcome to the March 15th regular meeting of council. The city of Parksville recognizes the people of the Coast Salish nations and their traditional territory upon which we gather with gratitude. Consent agenda for the minutes of council meetings, special council meeting and the approval of the agenda. Take them all together by Councillor Patterson, second by Councillor O'Brien. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Delegations. We have two delegations this afternoon. The first one is from uh, Peter Drummond. Are you there, sir? He is. I can see him. Please, you have uh, five minutes. Feel free. Uh, Are you there? Uh, uh, I'm here. I, I, don't, I don't know who you're speaking to, Mr. Maine. Oh, sorry. Uh, to you, sir. You're, 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 you were asked to make a uh, presentation. I did. Thank you. Please feel free. Uh, okay. First of all, my name is Peter Drummond. I'm a resident of Qualicum Beach, and now I'm a member of Parksville's OCAT, which is the Oceanside Action Team which is a provincially funded body aimed at harm reduction in drug addictions. But thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you today. I've spoken to uh, you, Mr. Mayor, and some of the council members in regards to the distressing number of losses in drug addiction. But let me begin by advising you just what the coroner's report states about overdosing deaths in Oceanside. Last year, 2020, the losses were reported to be 16. You can look that up online. However, as bad as that sounds, the OCAT is aware that the actual numbers are much worse. The numbers that we are working with now is at least 40. Now that's 2020. Every one, every nine days. And that is increasing this year in 2021. The discrepancy comes from what I would call assigning the cause of death. I don't wanna get into the details of this, but OCAT believes that often this favors natural causes rather than overdose, even when drugs are found in the body. So anyhow, I'm, I'm just a physiologist, I'm not a coroner, so I can't verify that, but this is the suspicion. In any case, the outcome is unacceptable. Today, I am asking the City Council of Parksville to work with me in harm reduction within our community. The plan will be of no cost to the city, but I only ask for your understanding that we have to do our best to stem the tide of the scourge of drug addiction. What I am seeking is a visible site in the center of the city so that I may erect a kiosk that would display photos of those who have died from overdosing and contact information for those who would benefit <clears throat> where it is in the realm of addictions or those that are suffering from mental illness and those that need persuasion not to enter into drug abuse. So what I have here, I hope you can all see this. This is the model that I've constructed about what I am talking about. Uh, there it is there, four sides. Um, it is constructed of about 130 cedar blocks, which measure 16 inches by eight inches, each one of these pieces. It would be, the structure would be nine feet high, eight feet wide, and of Art Deco design with four interior walls. There, I think you can see that. Um, the blocks are meant to rep or symbolize the people of the community. The spaces you see in there are those that are missing represent our missing members who have died of overdose. Uh, <clears throat> the obvious function of this is one of awareness and highlighting the harms of the community. <clears throat> um, the kiosk would be lighted on one interior side and activated by motion. 
the project overall seeks to humanize the addiction issue in a way which has not been explored previously, with one exception that I'm aware of, and that is in Courtney, which was temporary and now is not uh, visible. <clears throat> this project will be funded either by provincial grants or by local sources. The cost is projected to be about $3,700, as best I can, and would be constructed by myself and with the help of other woodworkers, not paid. I have a tentative agreement from Forward House, which I'm sure you're all aware of, to handle the maintenance of the kiosk in years to come. I mentioned earlier that I'm seeking a site, 64 square feet, eight by eight. The most obvious site that I can find in the city is directly adjacent to the city park above the ballparks and across from the Dairy Queen on Highway 19A. At that site, there's a widening of a grassy boulevard with two park benches and a crosswalk. There would be no obstruction to the walkway or cycling routes in positioning this on that boulevard. In future, if the city determines that the kiosk should be removed for whatever reason, I would build a central hook on the top of the kiosk so that it can be simply relocated and used for another purpose. My intent that it should become a city owned structure in future. In closing, let me say that this project alone will not rid the community of drugs, but it will contribute to the understanding of the magnitude of the problem which I discussed and to harm reduction. It is my hope that we can all be part of the solution towards a better lifestyle in Oceanside. If we do nothing, we simply lose more people, a younger generation, and that in itself would be very tragic. That's my presentation. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Roman. Uh, first question for you has come from Councillor Greer. Yes. <clears throat> Thanks for your presentation, uh, Mr. Yep. Um, it seems to me that we had someone uh, either a year or two years or maybe three years ago now present a similar thing to council. And yes. maybe, um, maybe somebody can verify whether we turned that down or whether we discussed it. Um, but it seems like this has come around once before. I don't know, I, I don't remember it coming to us. Well, it might've been the last council then. But anyways, I think it was presented at one time. Anyways, um, how much proof do you have that this actually helps the situation? Um, <clears throat> That's gonna be very hard for me to answer. Um, but here, here, I'll give it a try here. At present, the apparent strategy is to depersonalize drug overdosing. It receives no press, no mention in the obituary columns. It's forgotten. These folks are only a statistic, a number, and an accurate one of that, which I hope that I've described to you, to the public. The process is simply not working. The process, uh, sorry, the, uh, the facts now are much worse than they were to be a couple of years ago. I think it's more urgent now than then. Um, this process that I've described is what I call humanizing the problem. That's why I'd like to put those photographs of people there because it has much more impact on people viewing this thing. It's actually a form of tough love. The impact on young susceptibles can be, begin with school counselors, teachers, mental health professionals, and even the police to direct everyone to the source in Parksville. Uh, how can that not help? the issue, but I can only promise you this, that can be only better, not worse than before, and our numbers are increasing. Okay, um, Councillor Fraz, pardon me. Oh, follow up, I'm sorry. Thank you, Worship. Uh, just, just to follow up, have you approached the provincial government about rehab um, facilities for these people at all. And it's my feeling that it's a, a provincial uh, situation 
and they should be supplying rehab centers. In fact, right across the country for that matter, for drug addiction and also places for people with mental problems. And I think your organization, your first step should be to approach them to see what they intend to do. And up to now, they haven't done anything. Oh, thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that I'm a member of OCAT, you know, the Oceanside Community Action Team. That is provincially funded. We've got about a $50,000 a year, and we have more applications in for increased fundings. Those go out to the people that live in the bush. We have 396 people living in the, in the camps, which we're, uh, we don't have contact with them, except some of our members of OCAT do have contact. We don't know where they are. There's 16 camps out there. But in regards to your question about uh, provincial funding, the, uh, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the provincial uh, resources applied $323 million to that three years ago to the issue of drug addictions. And last uh, December, they applied another uh, 1.3 million in which our requests for funds for this particular structure are going to. But anyhow, it, it, uh, what I would like to do is to bring to your attention that my belief is that we have to do things on the ground here. We have provincial funds available to us, but I think it's up to us individuals in Oceanside to make sure these things work. And we have about 40 members of OCAT that are doing that, which you're probably not aware of, but there's all different aspects of that team that is applying the resources to a very good use. Um, I, I don't think it's not, it's not addressing, well, it is addressing the issue now, but the, it's an absolute overwhelming need for uh, this, this group of ours to do its uh, diligence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through the mayor to council and to Peter. First, Peter, I just wanna say thank you for coming to us uh, with your project there. I think the uh, design, that was my first time seeing the image of it and it uh, looks very well put together, very thoughtful. I think it's an attractive uh, type of a kiosk as well. Uh, when it comes to the overdose deaths in BC, um, one thing I think is, uh, that I discovered last week there, we had in the last year, 1,716 overdose deaths in BC. And to put that in perspective with COVID, there has been 1,400 deaths attributed. So this surpasses even what we see as our uh, largest pandemic of her area. Peter, you mentioned that there was uh, 16 deaths and then you said it's likely that's up to uh, 40. Um, can I just get clarification? Is that for, for which, which area? Are you talking about, is that for Oceanside? Is that for Parksville? Or what kind of uh, geographical area for that number? I can answer that. <clears throat> it's for Oceanside and it's for 2020. The 40 that we imagined are overdose deaths are, are that number you, you mentioned, 40. Thank you, and I have one but more. I, I cannot verify that. Uh, my other question is too, when you talk about uh, having um, in that kiosk photos, um, a couple of things that come to mind are, are, are the families of these individuals, are, would they be okay with having the, their photos on display? And, uh, and, and also with those photos, are they just looking at doing um, like a headshot of the individuals or what kind of photos? Um, and, and the reason why I asked too is that I, I'm, I, I expect that these would not be graphic photos that are gonna be um, displayed in that kiosk. Uh, no, they're not graphic. They're, <clears throat> they're photo shots of the individual themselves. Uh, I mentioned Courtney before they had a temporary display outside the library um, in the, the last two months of last year. Um, and it had a great deal of impact upon me because these are not numbers. These are people. They're young people for the most part, 16 years old up to 59. Uh, and but you mentioned about the um, difficulty, I guess you referred to that as difficulty of obtaining these pictures. I would have to have written permission from each individual family to do that. No names would be given, only the photographs. They'd probably be five by seven or something like that. 
and they'd be displayed on one side of the interior of the kiosk. Uh, it's going to be a great deal of difficulty for me to obtain these, but we already have, I have a friend on the golf course here in Qualicum Beach who lost a daughter three weeks ago, and I asked him about this, whether he would be, I described the project, and he said he was all behind it. So that's just one of many. But anyhow, uh, we have another woman, you've probably run across her, Kelly Morris, who has told me that she already has a number of people, family members who have agreed to have their photographs displayed. I don't have the number for that right now, but that would be a, a quite a mountain for me to, uh, to climb, to get all these, the permission. But even if there was 10 there, I would be happy with 10. In, in Courtney, there was about 80 people, young people who were displayed on that presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I would definitely expect that the, that the people or the families are okay with uh, anyone's photos who are putting up there. Yep. Uh, I, I would like to suggest a, a different location than what you put forward as, as far as uh, by the community park outside the Dairy Queen. Yep. And, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll put it forward as a motion to council too, um, so that it can be discussed and, and see what their thoughts are on that. But I'd like to, uh, I, I think the, at the end of the Jensen Greenway Trail, there's a, a little um, grassy area that's underutilized right now. Uh, I th believe this is the area that was, there was a request for a garbage can uh, to go in as well, um, next to Orca Place. And I think it could be a, a contribution in a, in a beneficial way, as you mentioned about the discussion about uh, drug addictions and mental illness. So I'll, I'll put forward that location. And if there's anyone else on council that want to second it, then we can discuss that. Sure. Okay. I'll uh, I'll hold it off till till the other questions are there. But um, but I'd like to discuss it then at, at this delegation. Thank you. Thank you uh, through your worship to uh, Dr. Drummond. Thank you, uh, Paul, for coming in today. It's uh, or, or, um, very interesting information. Um, you know, I think uh, it, it looks like something that's uh, had a lot of time and effort put into it. Um, I think the, the message needs to get out to uh, kids and parents that are walking around our town, uh, kids that are teenagers that are wandering around at night. Uh, being able to come across this structure, I think, is really important. I think, um, you know, uh, Councillor Fraz indicated about the 1,700 deaths. You know, since 2016, there's been 6,500 overdose deaths here in British Columbia, which is just absolutely staggering. And, and uh, when, you, when you look at those numbers, uh, that's, that's affected, you know, potentially five, 10, 15 family members, all suffering from, you know, issues of this, uh, this terrible disease. And so I think, you know, although it, it seems like it might be cumbersome or putting something like this in front of people that nobody wants to hear the message necessarily that this is happening, but I think it's a really important message, I think. Uh, I think uh, so much so that uh, somebody has their kids in town and they see this uh, placard and the kids start asking questions. I think it opens up a lot of good conversation. And I think that's where we need to start is with uh, kids and youngsters and you know the generation that's moving up towards the potential of this drug use. And uh, hopefully it helps everybody else as well. And just, just to let you know in closing that I have a brother that uh, he's been 14 years into heavy addiction um, he's a downtown east side individual. Um, he's bounced back and forth. And I got to say that since, uh, so I'm going to say 45 days ago, he was, uh, admitted into, um, a facility in Surrey and, um, we're, we have great hope, uh, that he's going to make it. So, uh, it's been his first time into rehab of any kind of successful, uh, uh outcome. So we really, we, we feel that uh, the government is starting to do a few things. They're starting to make headway and stuff. But uh, with the death of some local people that I know, in fact, uh, you mentioned the person in Qualicum, and I have a, a lady with a son that just recently passed away uh, in Orca Place. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a really sad situation. It's hitting us locally. So um, thank you for your efforts. And I would support 
this in some way, shape, or form. I think it's really important. Thank you. Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, and through the worship, if I can, uh, to Mr. Drummond, um, thank you very much for your presentation here today. And uh, uh, we spoke uh, at length on the phone one evening and uh, I enjoyed the conversation. You enlightened me quite a bit on the seriousness of the situation. Uh, and thank you for uh, trying to bring this attention uh, to this uh, very serious subject. Uh, uh, one quick question, if I could, uh, Mr. Drummond, um, are there any of these kiosks installed already? Uh, in any uh, in any form uh, in our area, I understand you're a member of the OCAT team, um, which uh, is Oceanside. Is there ha have you already approached Koala Beads and so forth? Are there there are other locations, or do you already have some up and running at this time? No, the answer is no. There's none that I'm aware of. Are, are I, have, I haven't approached the uh, the town of Koala Beach where I live. No. Sorry, you said you have not approached. I have town? not. No. Okay. Thank, no. Yeah. Thank. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. That's. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, you know to have a look at it, but um, obviously that's not the case yet. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I see no further questions. Thank you, Dr. Drummond. I, I appreciate your uh, your presentation, and um, I'd like to take a motion to receive this. First off, uh, Councillor Chandler, second by Councillor Wilson. All in favor of receiving? Now, Councillor. If you'd like to bring up your motion. Thank you. So I'd like to move that uh, that council um, look at providing a space at the end of the Jensen Greenway Trail for this uh, for this kiosk. And I would add that, uh, however, though, too, that it's contingent on getting the support from the Community Advisory Council for Orca Place. Okay. Seconded by Councillor Patterson. Discussion. Go ahead. So, and the reason why I mentioned the Community Advisory Council for Orca Place is it's a, it's made up of uh, neighbors from the area as well as Orca Place and other other stakeholders in, involved with it. And I think it would be appropriate to have their uh, their input and ultimately their blessing. Um, it, it does touch on the issue, I think, in a very mature way to look at things like he mentioned uh, from Peter there with addictions and mental illness, and following in the harm reduction model. Uh, one of the strategies has to utilize wet supportive housing like Orca Places. Uh, so I, I think this location could uh, benefit as far as it's known for the neighborhood that drug deals often happen outside on that street there. Uh, I've seen it myself in that location too. And I'd hope that by bringing this kind of information forward, it, it brings that kind of second sober thought to uh, what the consequences of, of these actions are, especially in public there. It's a very popular trail as well. So I think we get a lot of community exposure and hopefully, um, yeah, just bring that to top of mind for people of, of the people in our community that are, that are very real and affected by what goes on here. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Uh, this is an, actually a question to Councillor Fraz. Where are you thinking about this uh, being located? So if I may, the, uh, right at the end of Jensen Street here, uh, where it goes to the three-way stop on Corfield, there's that little sand dollar in the road. Uh, just on the sidewalk there, there's some stones uh, at the head of the trail, and the trail has kind of two points that merge into one, and it creates this little like grassy area in the center there. Um, that's where I believe that request for a garbage can would be looking to go to. Um, and it, right now it's not utilized. There's, there's no maintenance in there. There's nothing kind of set up. So I think this could be a feature that would complement it uh, well in there. Can I have a follow-up? Yes, please. Um, actually, the other question might be to you, Peter. Um, thank you for your presentation. Just thinking about this structure, and you said there was one in Courtney. It was temporary. Uh, it's not a structure. It was a, a banner with photographs. Oh, banner. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah well, so... With something like this, because it's representing Ocean Side, I'm wondering whether or not, uh, in, in this, not just to you, but perhaps up to all of council, to think about that it be a temporary, that we, we allow it as a temporary structure or a temporary location, and that it could be more mobile. So it could perhaps go to other communities in Ocean Side, intact, as you say, with you could have it move, just so that it becomes. Um, more um, 
you know, some, something that incorporates all of the communities because we're not the only communities where, where this is happening. So it's just another thought. Thank you. Okay, good. I've got a whole bunch of stuff here that I'm gonna just bring in. And then after that, Councillor O'Brien, if you don't mind. Um, first off from, I would suggest that perhaps we could refer this to staff. I, by the way, I'm totally in favor of the idea. I think it's a great idea. In fact, I even like the location of it because of its proximity uh, and, and, the, and what's going on in back and behind it. So I'm, I'm totally in favor of it, but I'd like to refer it to staff because I don't know what I don't know on that site and what it's going to involve and, and that. And I'd certainly like staff to, to at least have a, a conversation about it and bring it back. And then secondly, to Councillor Wilson's uh, comment, I, I would, not quite the same idea, but I'd like to make it on a one-year term for the first year just to see how it's going to go and what, what's going to happen with it and how it's received and so on. So it's not a, a long-term issue, but a one-year one term so that we can hopefully make it go on forever if, if we do it right. So those are the, the two things that I'm suggesting in the long run, but more from staff, and I'll put my glasses on so I can read CAO's writing. And can we ask for clarification of what the city is expected to do to support the installation insurance agreement to locate uh, installation costs and from contingent, and if, if this would come from contingencies, if there is a cost. So um, I think those are all things that staff could probably, if we referred it to them, that, that might make some sense to have them come back with all those answers, if that were the case. So before I, I have Councillor O'Brien next, and then Councillor Greer. Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, and uh, through to Mr. Drummond. Um, as I understood from your description, Mr. Drummond, the kiosk itself had a hook on the top of it. So I'm thinking that you're, you're planning on once it's built, delivering it by a HIAB truck, uh, equipped HIAB uh, to just drop it in location at the approved location. Is, uh, would that be your responsibility, sir? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. I, I would bring it in, in in five pieces. Thank, thank you. And, and, and then for, further to the conversation uh, as per the location, um, I think it would be wiser at this time to leave it more open-ended as to determining the location. I know that there's some issues with the um, uh, possible with the uh, Councillor Fraz's uh, location uh, with the Bagshaw improvement going through those gardens where it had plans set up for it. But regardless, uh, the thing is, is that a little more, I, I would suggest an, an amendment to that, a little more open-ended to uh, determining the location, but uh, accepting uh, Mr. Drummond's offer to some place in uh, Parksville and uh, going along with Councillor Wilson's suggestion that it becomes a mobile uh, area because uh, mobile kiosks, so like as you suggest, if it has a hook on top of it, it could be picked up and then moved to other Oceanside areas once it's served its purpose or its timing, as the mayor has mentioned in, uh, in Parksville, it could be moved along and that way you're, you're getting more effective communication throughout the entire ocean side area. I, I think that that would be a, a strong way to go at this point. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to, I don't know if we can even, it be, would be a friendly amendment, but we'll try it on and see, make the friendly amendment to refer this to staff so they can come back with the answers to the questions. If that's up to the two individuals that may accept or you don't, it's up to you. Please, please. I, I think getting some input from staff as far as costs would be beneficial because of course there will like, there will be preparation, you know, to the ground of it needs to have pavers perhaps in place to put that on. I can't imagine you just drop that onto a rough surface uh, to have it done. Um, at the same time though too, like there's the comment about the location being more open-ended. Uh, I, I think the location is, is where I'd like to have it uh, um, debated on or, or ultimately voted on. It's not, at, it's on the opposite end of the community garden. So on this end of uh, Corefield and, and Jensen there, um, it does have a pillar, a post to be able to be removed for things like a truck to be able to make a delivery. It provides very easy access to it. I think more so than the little landing across from the Dairy Queen. Um, 
don't know exactly the best way to go about this. If we just refer back to staff for then a future council meeting to bring it back up. Uh, at the same time, I think it would also need to go to, like I say, the community advisory count committee to uh, get their input. But uh, I think it would be great to have some kind of direction from here if we're willing to keep moving forward or not. Could I suggest then that we refer it back to staff with your with your, um, I guess be referred to staff uh, for this location and for the or a place community advisory council's input, and also establish the questions that, and establish uh, the cost and, and uh, exactly. city. Um. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. All right, so we, we I need uh, we're we're voting on the we've got a second on the amendment is what we're doing on the friendly amendment. We actually we don't even need a second on this so. Yes, you may. I'm just wondering uh, when you talk about location and going back to the advisory board committee, we might consider consulting the people in the neighborhood as well. That's, well. that's who that advisory committee is. Yeah, I think that's very important because what we might like is what somebody that lives in that area might not like. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay. So if everybody is okay with that referral, I'll take, I'll call the vote on, on referring it. All those in favor, opposed, it's carried unanimously. Thank you. Dr. Drummond, that'll go to our staff to fill in all the blanks for us. So we got all the answers for you and they will probably be in contact with you to, with more questions than, than that as well. Certainly, that's fine, yep. All right, so we'll move as quickly as we can on this. And uh, we'll we'll keep you informed. Thanks. Thank you for everything. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. All right. Now we're ready for our second delegation from the Parksville Downtown Business Association. Um, is it Michelle Jones and um, Pamela Bonley that are there? Is okay. Pam, is Michelle going to join you? Yes, she is, yep. Okay. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you just fine, thank you. Excellent. We... I think this is Michelle down here. Pardon? Oh, there she is. Okay, we've got her. Fair enough. Michelle, can you hear us? We can't hear you. Are you on mute? Yes, you are. Yes, I can. Now I can. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, and please. Thanks, sir. thanks everyone. Um, for the sake of the uh, virtual gallery and the archive, uh, thank you, your worship and council and staff for having us again today, our annual visit. Um, I'm Pam Bottomley, Executive Director of the Parksville Downtown Business Association, and joining me today from our Board of Directors is Michelle Jones of Timberlake Jones Engineering. She's our secretary treasurer. Um, and thanks to so many of you who were able to join us at our annual meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was great to see so many people there. Um, just a wee bit of background. Um, the Parksville Downtown Business Association was uh, incorporated as a not-for-profit society in 2006. So we're marking 15 years of uh, working to enhance and promote Parksville downtown. Um, we're funded by the commercial, uh, the owners of commercially assessed properties within the business improvement area. And they've chosen for 15 years to continue to be taxed to um, pay for the work that we do. Um, and since that time, we've invested more than $2 million in the city of Parksville. Um, so I will um, turn the rest of our very brief presentation over to Michelle, who will review our budget and financial statements. And we're both here to answer any questions you might have about that, uh, those topics or any of our operational items or plans for the future. It's been quite a year. Um, we're still here and still working hard. Thanks, uh, Pam. Um, just wanted to uh, um, 
I guess our, for our financial statements, I think everybody has copies of those. So I won't go through them line by line. I think a lot of you were at the meeting. I just wanted to highlight some of the projects that are in our budget for 2021. And those include the final phase of our joint project with the city of Parksville to complete the downtown wayfinding project. This is the last phase of a three phase project. We have ordered the signs, so it will be getting installed here, hopefully in the spring. Um, just on the last delegation, I just wanted to remind the city that we do have a signpost going in the location that you have recommended the uh, that kiosk to go. So I think we need to work together on that. And just that's just a reminder there. Um, but we also are looking to restart our litter pickup throughout the downtown core. We're hoping to work with the Orca Place clean team. We're trying to work that out. The uh, Our last uh, provider of that service is no longer interested. So we're hoping to do that. And then we'll still have our um, safety and security and our facade improvement grants. And hopefully we'll get a big uptake in those this year. And then the other thing that we're trying to do is, um, I guess not trying, yeah, trying, um, they're downtown ambassadors. We don't know if we'll be allowed to have downtown ambassadors, um, but we're gonna try. So we'll, we'll, uh, we've budgeted for those and hopefully they'll be able to start this summer, but we really don't know what we will and won't be allowed to do, <coughs> excuse me. And then the other thing that we put in our budget again is enhanced lighting, Christmas lighting for the downtown. I know that everyone appreciates the lighting that the city and the uh, PDBA do together on the Alberni Highway. And if you'll remember last fall, I believe it was, we talked about doing some enhanced lighting and it was in the budget deliberations. I don't think it's made it forward yet but uh, we would really like to work with the city to enhance the lighting in the downtown, especially at Christmas time. And with that, I just, if you've got any questions regarding our budget or the financial statements, I can answer them at this time. Thanks. Councilor Wilson, Councilor O'Brien. Through the mayor. Uh, thanks, Michelle. I just had a question. Did you have a, a specific amount of money in mind for, up, up for the Christmas light? Enhancement? Uh, we've got $20,000 in our Christmas budget, um, but we had looked last year at spending more than that if we were going to be able to do the, the I can't think they were called banner toppers on the street lights in the downtown core. We were going to work with the city and pick a, one street to start on and then work it out over the next three to, you know, two to three years. Um, and we have we have some extra money if we need it if if we can move that project forward. Councilor Wilson, follow up. Thank you. Uh, do you have an amount that you would like the city to contribute to this fund, or is this something we're just going to work with you on what you have? I believe there was a pro proposal put together by the director of operations back in September that had different options for that lighting program and they ha all had different funding scenarios and I'm not up to date on what those were. Um, I mean, I guess we could go back to look at his report, but he did do a report to you when you started budget deliberations, I believe it's in September. Thank you, Councilor O'Brien. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you very much to the PDBA. Uh, I'm really happy to see that the wayfinding system is reaching a conclusion this year. Good on you for sticking with it all this time. Um, I'm excited to see it to come to completion. It's been a long haul, and I applaud you for sticking with it. Uh, I think it's going to be worth it in the end, and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, having this completed. Also, to, for your efforts for the, your clean team, uh, working uh, with uh, the Orchid Place and so forth. I, I, I commend you very much for that as well. Uh, we have had other players in the past and it made a difference in our downtown and it was really effective. Uh, uh, so I, I, I applaud you for going after the, uh, another uh, contractor to supply those services and that's good. And I just want to say, uh, and I, I applaud your resilience, uh, for, as you say, a year like none other. Uh, you made it through this one type of thing. I think we're almost at the end here. 
uh, but uh, the PDBA uh, has come through it rather well, I must say, and you were uh, very supportive anyways uh, for those uh, uh, downtown businesses anyways that needed it. And uh, your efforts were not, um, uh, were noticed, all that I can say. Your efforts were definitely noticed anyways to, to keeping the local buying going on. So well done, thank you for that. Councillor Chandler. Thank you, uh, through your worship to the delegation. Uh, thanks both Pam and Michelle for the, uh, for the connection. And, and uh, I, I really appreciate being the uh, liaison on your association there. I think it's, uh, it's, it's been a good eye opener as far as what's going on downtown there. And I think there's lots of good things happening. I think we're all working together to make it all um, a better downtown. There's no question about it. I think there, I've seen over the last uh, two, three, four years where things are actually really starting to happen down there with lots more construction, uh, lots more infrastructure being built up there. So I, I think we're on our way to having a pretty, pretty amazing downtown core there long term. Uh, it's still lots to do and I appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. Appreciate it. I need a mover and a seconder. We could do all three recommendations together if we wish. Moved by Councillor Wilson, second by Councillor Patterson. Discussion on any of them or all of them? And then I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Parksville Beach Society in attendance with Mr. Druxy. And uh, Mr. Druxy, would you like? Come on and talk to us. Mr. Druxy. It is, uh, but it says in attendance Mr. with Mr. Druxy. Oh, is, it says that he's going to, okay. Okay, Lloyd, are you there? There's Joe. Look, we need Lloyd to show up somewhere in here. He's not there? Oh, okay. Go ahead, please, Mr. Druxy. Uh, if, if I may, through your worship, I'm just gonna share a screen here. Uh, we've got a short presentation to give a, a bit of a, um, um, a bit of the background and current uh, state for the, uh, the um, the performance uh, outdoor performance stage. So, just okay. Screen two. Let me know. You should start to see uh, a bit of a, uh, a an outline, kind of uh, uh, for the project update. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, this is just a project update to kind of tell you where things are at with the, uh, the state of the design, the funding, and the, uh, the current, uh, I guess, some of the, the updates and changes that have happened over the last uh, uh, six months or so. Uh, so as, as most of us are kind of aware, uh, the project was kind of initiated with the uh, Beach Festival with the, uh, the, uh, the approval and uh, direction of the previous council and then, and then uh, endorsed again and uh, continued with this current council. Um, uh, as some are aware, there was a, a grant from the Island Coastal Economic Trust in the neighborhood of about $204,750. Um, that funding uh, was fairly flexible and it was also allowed to be stacked with an additional grant that the city and Beach Fest applied for. Um, and that was the Provincial and Federal Investment in Canada program, uh, and, and specifically the, uh, the culture, community and recreation, the CCR stream. Uh, so that total funding um, um, would have been the 926,540 uh, uh, or 73% 70, of the total eligible project cost of 1.2 million uh, uh, there. So. That is kind of, um, that's kind of where the funding is at. Where we're at in terms of uh, finances is uh, uh, that, that $1.2 million budget that was used for the grant uh, proposal, that included uh, $57,650 in design and $75,000 in project management fees. Uh, the way we're administering the project is with a, with a, 
uh, using some design services uh, bespoke to the various disciplines, but using a, an architectural office to uh, facilitate um, the, the project management and uh, the design for construction uh, portion. So the, the 57 and the 75 uh, more or less get combined uh, to deliver the project to fruition. Um, currently where we're at, this is just kind of a breakdown of some of the, um, the various services and the uh, um, elemental costs that are associated. Uh, right now, we're currently have got commitments in the neighborhood of about 81,000 uh, out of the overall budget of 132,650. So we're still doing well for our design budget uh, uh, to date. Uh, going forward, and probably the more interesting part is to uh, give you a little bit of an update of uh, where the current design is at and uh, some of the things that have happened to change uh, with, with uh, engaging the architect. So some things have come out of uh, uh, building code um, design. So one of them is uh, the existing ramp that was shown conceptually was, uh, was too steep and not long enough. And so what we've done is we've lengthened it. Um, and of course that comes at a cost. And so we've also removed the, the, the ramp on the, um, on the west side. Um, it looked nice in, in site plan view and uh, created a very symmetrical uh, appearance. However, it didn't tie into anything uh, for you know handicapped or pedestrian accessibility. And, and there was little uh, and there was little um, there was little development need on this side to facilitate the, uh, the pedestrian uh, um, access on that side. So we focused on improving this, uh, this side, as you see there. Um, otherwise, you can see kind of the key critical points of this, um, of this thing. So we got, uh, so your access driveway here uh, with, with room to uh, bring in a box van or a truck uh, uh, to the site, it'll be a little bit more difficult and then require some backing up movements uh, to be coordinated if there's a uh, lengthier semi trailers. Uh, however, this, this should suffice for the majority of the types of events that would be scheduled there. There is a small turnaround area and then some additional uh, parking in a loading zone uh, established here. Um, uh, you'll see it more in detail later on, but some of the changes were some of the wings on the rear of the building have been removed and that of course uh, reduces the cost a little bit. It gets rid of uh, some darker corners potentially that could become um, how we call septed or crime prevention through environmental design. So just trying to eliminate some of the uh, uh, locations where um, uh, it might, might encourage uh, uh, misbehavior, if you will. Uh, let's see, there's a small vault in the front that is uh, where a, a base speaker could be placed uh, uh, to protect it uh, for weather. Um, it's not critical to the design, but that's where it's shown there. Um, and then there's this exposed aggregate walkway that goes around the perimeter of the facility, um, as you see there. Uh, nine, uh, this is where the public viewing area would be for the stage, and then a sound, uh, uh, a sound mixing booth would be out uh, uh, beyond that area. Um, moving to the next slide, I'll get a little bit more detail here to show some of the changes. So uh, this is the floor plan as it's currently proposed. Uh, there are some minor changes to that. Again, you see this uh, wall, the, these wing walls are removed. Um, there, you previously had a bit of a concave or convex, sorry, <laughs> depending on which like, a side of the wall you're on, a uh, convex wall here. Uh, intended to direct sound outward. It, it created a bit of a double wall, uh, which comes at a bit of a cost. And upon review, we found that it could be, uh, we could perform the same function using some uh, strategic uh, wood panels to direct the sound outward uh, accordingly. We've also been able to include some doorways to this central uh, aisle for easier access um, from the, the stage performers to the dressing rooms in, in this area. Uh, Here's dressing room one and dressing room uh, two, or vice versa, vice versa, dressing room one and dressing room two. Uh, this room here is for storage. And then we've got a mechanical room over here. Uh, let's see, what else has uh, changed? Not too much has drastically changed. Uh, that's the big ones. Um, like I say, access directly to that hallway and closer to the dressing room so that they don't have to uh, go outside. Um, 
here's where some other uh, changes have come into play. So um, along with the architect, we found some, some areas where we could save uh, in concert between the architect and the structural uh, design team. Uh, They're able to reduce uh, some of the sizing of the, the, the timbers and, um, and then also uh, simplify the roof uh, truss system. So you can see this is the, old, the original conceptual design. Um, it's, it's tough, well, it's tough to see a lot of the detail here uh, at this scale, but you can see um, with this new uh, design, we're able to put the loading down onto one wall and, and reduce the number of footings required. So that'll help save some cost. And then uh, similarly, we were able to uh, cut back a fair bit um, um, of the timber cost associated, again, by reducing that uh, size and then uh, there's a, a large, uh, this beam here on the outside gets eliminated as it being unnecessary. And then uh, 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 again, a similarly reduction of some of this fascia board and height over here. And uh, again, uh, that main beam that went across the front, that's also been able to be reduced uh, and, and still meet the structural requirements for the building. So it's a little bit trimmer and, and cleaner and neater. and. Uh, and a little bit more cost effective, I think, with some of the changes that have been uh, realized here uh, into that final design. Here you can just kind of see uh, some of the impacts there. We're going from an 18, uh, what do you call it, five by, just zoom in a hair. Uh, uh, these 18 inch rafters then going to uh, our, get that straight. So it used to be a 24 inch rafters going down to 18 inch rafters. And then uh, similarly, um, the old uh, glue lamb, 45-inch uh, glue lamb becomes a 41-inch, uh, um, albeit a uh, wider glue lamb beam. Um, but again, it, it reduces the cost uh, a little bit and, uh, and saves us some money. And here you can see those uh, wing walls that stuck out into the rear of the building. Um, those are also uh, now eliminated. They, they, they serve no particular structural purpose. They were uh, for aesthetics, um, but in... Um, being mindful of, again, SEPTED, uh, uh, that crime prevention through environmental design, just through that process, trying to eliminate any, any area or anything that, uh, if it's not absolutely necessary, that might uh, become an area where people could, uh, could do mischievous activities. Um, so that's the big crux of the design. I'll just uh, You can see up here where there'll be some locations. I, I, I missed that for some electric hookups, again, for speakers and, uh, and power. And then, uh, and then finally here, I guess, get some renderings of what this thing could actually look like. Um, this would be that uh, a vault, uh, if there were a, a base speaker, a vault could be placed out front to, uh, to protect it from uh, uh, rain loading. Uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, protection from the, uh, from the frontal elements and, uh, and critters could still be an issue, uh, but uh, that's basically where that would be. Um, these outside uh, columns uh, and beam, they've been, uh, they're being designed to be able to handle uh, hanging speakers should they be required by, uh, by a, a band or a presentation that would come out and use the stage. So it'll be equipped to be able to handle that kind of a hanging load, if you will. And then there'll be speaker platforms out here and out here for like the conventional spack, uh, stacked uh, uh, speaker systems that you see. Um, that's just another view of the same. Um, there is, I guess I should mention, there is, uh, you see this jut out wall right here. And uh, similarly on, on this side, this jut out wall, there's a screen system uh, that was included within the conceptual plan uh, that would go across the front of the st stage to, uh, to secure the entire structure uh, or the interior of the structure um, uh, when it's not in use, um, we're still working through some of the details and su suitability with the uh, with the architect to, to confirm if if that um, if that's going to hold up to the environment. Uh, there were some concerns that have come up late in the game here around uh, uh, the operations and maintenance of that type of system, if it's intended for outdoor use or not, and uh, and and whether it will facilitate that's intended use or if it would be better served to be just open. Uh, we're still working out through some of those details though and, and don't have the, that answer just yet, but uh, we're kind of defaulting to, to leave the design in as is. And, um, um, 
and we can we can deal with that as a late entry if we if we want to exclude it we can exclude it but leave the design uh, having the ability to have it added if we want to or we could include it uh, within the tender but we can deal with that uh, later on uh, when we're when we're dealing with ten uh, the tender process and the award of the tender process um, uh, kind of like an optional add-on if we want to go that road or not go that uh, road. But um, again, uh, at the time when we'd be presenting that, we would have some more information in hand uh, to make that uh, make a recommendation around that. So for right now, we're we're just kind of trying to design it to be flexible uh, to meet those needs um, should they arise. Uh, again, that's that other view. Here would be a side view. Um, this is another area where some changes have been made. Um, uh, we're proposing um, just to put the rock up, I uh, believe it's to the about the eight foot or 10 foot level. Um, and that has to do with some code issues uh, uh, for, for earthquake uh, resilience. Um, it's required once they get it past, uh, I think it's 10 feet. Um, these, uh, these type of rock walls would have to be engineered and uh, a considerable cost uh, increases start to arise out of that. So we were open to entertaining having um, um, like a siding, wood plank siding uh, uh, type uh, type wall above that. And uh, we've also incorporated a couple of windows to have some just ambient natural light to uh, uh, be able to go into the, to the storage room and dressing areas. So as, as need be. So that's, uh, that's again, kind of the rear view of the same. And that's, that's the theater as it would, uh, as it would be, um, constructed to date. Uh, currently, we're, we're at the point of uh, initiating the building permit application. Uh, part of the associated schedules to that building permit are, are with the administration now. We're just trying to get those executed and, uh, and then we'll be working through the details with the building department to address any uh, additional uh, items. So um, it should be ready for tender uh, towards the end of March is the, is the goal. And, uh, and depending on the timing, the pricing and the schedules of the, the responding contractors, we'll, we'll know more information, but it, it theoretically could be built in the next uh, couple months and be completed. So that's, uh, that's where we're at. And um, thank you. I'll start with Councillor Fraz. Thank you through the mayor to Joe Doxey. Thanks for the presentation there. I really like seeing the uh, the pictures for it. The visuals are really helpful and it, uh, it, I think it's looking great. A couple of quick questions. I'll throw them out there both at once here. Um, you showed where the wheelchair ramp access is uh, going from the, uh, from the roadway um, to the amphitheater. I'm curious as to where the viewing area would be for anyone that would be needing wheelchair access or if they're just going to be out in the grass. Um, and the other question would be, uh, is there any pre-planning and wiring for security cameras uh, for the amphitheater there? What kind of security measures you have aside from the gate? Thank you. Um, good questions. Um, there isn't a lot of provision out of the hat for, um, um, for hardened uh, uh, surface in, in the, uh, in, in the uh, for the viewing area for handicap accessibility. Um, there was some discussion early on about brick pavers uh, being used out, out front. Um, that, that hasn't been necessarily um, precluded or eliminated from the design, and, and some of that will come out of the, the civil site works. If, if there is room to include some, some provision for a uh, handicapped, accessible, hardened, uh, hardened surface area, uh, we'll certainly we'll look at doing that. It'll, it'll come down to budget and... Um, um, Really, it'll come a lot down to budget, and if we can if we can undertake it within the current allotment, uh, we'll certainly will do so. Um, but that 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 effort still is in the works with the civil uh, site design side of things uh, and the landscaping design, and, and those elements are still in the works. Um, what was the other question there? The uh, other question was in regards to security cameras and so on, and just also just if I can then touching on the uh, viewing area, perhaps maybe things like the Moby mats can be rolled out then if, if as a temporary fix if needed, but I, I hear you on this budget could be in a future time then. Yeah, ab absolutely. Possibly uh, mobility uh, mats could be placed out, uh, you know, towards the to the bottom of that ramp uh, area, depending on the size and scale of the uh, uh, presentations that are going on for that for that evening or day. Um, the um, the uh, security cameras, um, 
it's being plumbed uh, to have that as an accommodation. Um, we'd be working through that within our operational budgets um, uh, in terms of exactly what type of system uh, in concert with our IT department uh, down the road. Um, the cameras are not planned to be installed uh, necessarily out of the hat, but there's a fair amount of coordination that has to still happen uh, uh, between operations, IT, and uh, and the city, I, I guess a whole, just getting those, uh, what kind of cameras, what kind of systems, and, and what network uh, telephony is available between the, the community park and uh, whether it's operations or bylaw or CMP. So there's a, a lot of details to that end that we still have to work out, but we'll we'll simply plummet to to have it, you know as much as we can for internet connectivity and in power. Thank you, Councillor Greer. Thank you, Your Worship, and through to Joe. Thanks, Joe, for your presentation. Just a couple of questions. I was wondering what the height of the stage is. It doesn't look, on the drawings, it doesn't look very high. Do you know how high, high the stage is? Uh, off the top of my head, um, I don't recall exactly how high above the ground it is. I want to say it's about a meter. Um, but, but Lloyd from Beachfest, uh, he may know the precise uh, elevation difference, but I, I, think, I, th I think we're pretty close to around a meter mark. Yeah, it, it didn't, on the drawings, it didn't look much more than that. I thought that might be a little bit, or it should might have been a little higher. The other question was, I noticed the stairs going up the front of the stage. That to me looks a little cumbersome. Why wouldn't the, sta the stairs be at the side of the stage? Maybe I could answer that. Uh, yeah. That's uh, that's a con concept of our uh, of our architect that put them there, and and they really could go on the side. We we just thought it might be for people that are you know when you want crowd participation and something uh, like that, people could come right up from the crowd and straight up that way. But they could certainly be moved around the side. I think there's I think there's pros and cons to uh, to both. It just it just and takes just further to the height, uh, Councillor Greer. Yeah, it's just over three feet. Uh, three feet high. And if you go any higher than that, I believe that you need a railing in front, uh, you know, just a, a protective railing. So this way uh, it's high enough that it's up, uh, give, allows good viewing. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you don't need a railing up across the front. That's fine, thanks. The other, the other thing was the stairs. It takes away from the stage. It looks like it takes up part of the stage, of course, and looks to me like it's a little cumbersome. I, I think most entrances up to a stage is usually on the side. So anyways, that was just a question and I thought maybe you could look at that. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, through the mayor. Thank you, Joe, for your presentation. Um, I agree with Councillor Greer. That actually was a, a good point. It probably would look nice with the stairs on the side. My question is the color. Is this is the white just because of the rendering or is this going to be natural wood siding? At this point, it's, it's just uh, to facilitate a rendering. Um, we haven't worked out the final, um, um, if it's gonna be hardy board or if it's gonna be natural cedar. Uh, we haven't worked out the, that level of detail yet. So in our, in our part of the presentation, folks, it'll answer that question a little bit, Councillor Wilson. And it's, Sorry. It's, you know, we, we chatted with Sylvia, the architect, about that. And so we're going to see some color op options for warming it up oh, or keeping it second. cooler. Cheryl, just for a second, because can we turn Cheryl, uh, turn their, their volume up a bit so we can hear it? Sorry, I, we just can't hear you very well. I can speak a little louder and take my mask off when I speak. Is that better? There, now we've got you. We've got all the things going that we need to go. So. <laughs> Go. Oh, what were you going to say? What did you say? Could you repeat it for me, please? So what I had said, uh, Mayor uh, Maine, is that this is the first that we've seen uh, just last week of the potential images of the stage with these changes that Joe mentioned. And, um, you know, I think our architect tends to like uh, a more contemporary uh, kind of cooler um, style of building and um, 
this is the first option that we've seen for colors. And while it like looks nice and, and clean, it is, is, it is fairly light. And so we have said, perhaps we can see a few other color options just to warm it up a little bit. Thank you. So we're back to fusion wall and, uh, and some of the baffles you'll, you'll see there's uh, some options there as well. Thank you. But we'll have that in our renderings uh, after Joe's part is done. Thanks a lot. Councillor Wilson, then we're going to move to Councillor. Can I put in a request that it, you look at natural colors to <coughs> blend a little more? If I may, to your worship, certainly we can, uh, we can have that discussion with the, uh, with the architect. Thank you. Councillor O'Brien. And pink is not the color they're looking for. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, yeah, special thanks too to uh, Mr. Doxy there, uh, your expertise and collaboration with uh, the, the Beast Fest group is very much appreciated. You, you brought a lot to the table. I've seen a lot of changes type of thing and it, I, it, it's definitely going in the right direction the way it's morphing and I appreciate uh, uh, your involvement here. It's, it's been a real asset to, to the group and thank you very much for that. Um, I was just going to touch base. Uh, Councillor Greer brought up the fact of the stairs of uh, projecting forward. As I recall, very early days uh, with uh, Mr. Derry, uh, we talked about the steps being on the front and stuff like that. And part of the reason was, is like performing dance troops and so forth. They do a lot of participation up on the stage, but a lot of times they will project down into the audience and they will actually mingle with the audience. And some groups and so forth would do that as well. They'll go out on acoustic or something like that and actually get down on the grass in front of us. So that was, I think, one of the reasons that we talked about those stairs on the front. It's just an idea anyways. It makes it easier, uh, more, uh, more of an involved uh, performance and uh, spectator um, viewing uh, option. My question, I guess, is to back to Mr. Doxy at this point. Um, it, is it all pre-wired for sound systems and, and all the wiring necessary for all the amplifiers and so forth? Because uh, these, um, you know, when the Rolling Stones show up here, you know, they're going to take a lot of juice. So the thing is, is that are we ready for that? And uh, what, what type of um, provisions have been made so that we have enough power to handle the, the amplification if they should show up and so forth? And does your budget include um, Am, not amplification, but actually speakers actually hung up from the rafters, or is that um, everybody brings their own? How does how is that going to work? If I may, through your worship, um, it will be plumbed uh, for speaker connections uh, uh, to the various points and corners. Um, like I mentioned, the uh, uh, that outside beam uh, corner uh, being designed to handle uh, the loading uh, associated with hanging uh, uh, speaker towers. Uh, again, in this corner. Uh, Corner uh, stack speaker mounts being uh, plumbed again to uh, to have speaker hookups available, um, so it will be plumbed for that. But the the actual hardware for uh, say microphones and speakers uh, at at this point in time they're they're not within the the build out budget. Um, there's some discussion items uh, within a. Uh, 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 upcoming presentation here from uh, Beach Fest side of things um, to discuss some of the options and uh, and scenarios around that. But uh, as a base structure, it'll just be it'll be just a uh, just a, an outdoor. Uh, it'll be an acoustic outdoor theater with a provision for electric uh, um, uh, performance uh, amplification as need need be or see fit. So, thank you. No further questions. I would assume that uh, Mr. Derry and Ms. Dill would like to speak. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, so I would like to share the screen. Is that okay if I do that, Amanda? She's saying yes. Okay, great. I will do that now. So just bear with me here. Break it. <laughs> now I'm just going to uh, do a few things to adjust my screen here so that you can see what's happening. Now, can you see, uh, is your screen showing outdoor theater for the performing arts? You're fine. Okay, great. 
So uh, thank you very much, um, Your Worship uh, and Council. I, we really very much appreciate being here with you today. Um, and we, we do want to say thank you so much to Joe Doxey for all of his patience and, and, and willingness to collaborate with uh, the Beach Festival Society and specifically Lloyd and myself. And uh, it's been a great process and we're very, very grateful for that. And want to thank um, Teresa and prior to Teresa, Doug, for their support along the way. And also, of course, mayor and council. It's been very much um, a great process working with the city and also with the city staff. And we're just going to take a few minutes here to bring you up to speed with some of the other considerations that um, have been just recently discussed this afternoon. Um, with the development of this theater, uh, you know, it's such an exciting legacy that we are going to have here for our community. And we know the quality of this theater and what we're all of the thought and energy and effort putting forward that this will be Vancouver Island's premier outdoor entertainment facility. Uh, one of the things, this, these renderings that you're looking at right now are just some renderings from our sound consultant that Lloyd's worked really closely with Ron Vermeulen who has a very distinguished uh, past in working with uh, lots of performers who have done very, very well. And uh, he he's an excellent sound uh, acoustics engineer um, consultant. So he's been very great on this project to work with and very willing to share his knowledge. Um, one of the things that we realized when we're thinking about, okay, construction is such a huge part of this project, but that will come and go. And we're really excited about the fact that we've got grants to cover that and, and that we're working with Joe and the architects on that. But one of the things in order to make this operational is about getting the equipment in this facility so that we can have a variety of users, which is one of the main focuses of the stage is that it, it uh, attracts users of all groups, dance troops, choirs, symphony, orchestras, you name it. Um, and that rock band that we're talking about. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that Lloyd and I worked together on, and uh, I wanna commend Lloyd for all of his work for doing the research and getting quotes on, on equipment, but we put an arts grant together for BC Art Council. In January, we heard that we weren't successful. We were not successful because they had so many applications. But just last week, we got the news that we were. They extended the um, funds for us. So we were able to achieve $40,000 towards equipment to outfit this stage. And our budget for outfitting the stage with sound, lighting, dance floor, and risers is 57,000. So we're continuing to uh, raise the additional 17,000 to meet our budget goal. So we're really excited about that. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lloyd to tell you about the equipment. Uh, and the other thing is that we want to ask for your support to go ahead and purchase that equipment and install it. We wanna talk about operations in this presentation a bit later, but we're hoping for your support and Lloyd's gonna to talk to you about that equipment. Thanks very much, folks. And yeah, so just a quick outline on, on some of the various equipment that, that we think is crucial to properly uh, equip the stage. And a sound system would be uh, would be the most crucial requirement uh, for the vast majority of renters. Other venues and professionals we've consulted have highly recommended that we have a good sound system. And this is other, ven other outdoor venues. Bigger acts may still bring in their own systems, but this system is designed to handle a majority of users. And like Cheryl mentioned, that could include musical acts, student performances, performance competitions, dance troops, indigenous celebrations, Highland games, graduation ceremonies, school arts and cultural activities, music and dance recitals, really the list just goes on and on. So the sound system itself would include uh, what you see there now, four front end speakers, two bass bins, all the related equipment that, that could look after, you know, a small band or most of the other users that would, that would come in. Um, we've taken steps. We know that council as well as ourselves are, are concerned about, uh, about security, concerned about the effect that humidity might have on any of this equipment. 
we've done a bunch of research. We've taken steps to make sure that the speakers and all the electric connections are, are going to be well protected from all of those, uh, all of those, uh, you know, all those things. Now, that cement compartment that you see in front of the stage, the, the speakers, the front end speakers, we would store in the theater when they're not used, but we would like to leave the base bins out front. It's a, it's a secure cement enclosure. I've talked to the folks from Express Custom Manufacturing right here in Parksville. They can, they can put a front on that that's totally secure. It'll be dry. Um, I think we could spray some insulation, spray insulation in the front of it. And to leave those base bins in there for the season, take them out in the winter because they're, they're big and they're awkward and heavy. So uh, that's what we're proposing. And, and we're taking all the steps to make sure that we protect protected the longevity of, of all those things. And in this next slide, Cheryl's just going to uh, go quickly over uh, the other equipment that we are recommending. Mm -hmm. So the other equipment uh, comprising the remainder of that fund would be choir and drum risers, as well as a portable dance floor system and spotlights. So we're going to tell you a little bit more about these things. Essentially, you know, if you're thinking about the Island Soul Choir, which has, you know, well over a somewhere between 100 to 200 people singing on the stage, the Craig Bay Choir, school choirs, jazz bands, you name it, we need to have this type of staging available. It's very difficult for these groups to bring their own. They just simply do not have that. Um, so we've done some great research on what it is, what would be ideal. Uh, dance floor system. Uh, we've looked at two options uh, and they're essentially the same. They're really about four rolls of 30 foot long material that's 6.45 feet wide. The rolls would be uh, connected with double face tape and then there's cleaning supplies that come along with that. So that's the dance floor system when we connect it with the local dance troops they indicated they will not perform in this theater unless there is a dance floor system and that's not something that they come along with when they perform. So this would allow us to host those very beautiful performances that we all want to see. Spotlights are very important. Um, when you consider the lighting, there's the house light inside the stage. Um, and that's what we're talking about here, not the lighting in front of the stage that you know larger groups would bring. This is about spotlights overhead. Um, this would be well protected from the weather and could stay up there for the season. And I guess just before we leave that equipment, the whole premise folks behind the, behind the equipment, uh, properly equipping the stage is we really wanna make it accessible for our whole community and beyond. And if, if these things can't be included, if, if they don't have access to them, they're gonna have to go and rent this this stuff and that gets expensive and probably could lead to them not even not even using the facility because it's just it's just out of their price range. This rendering here uh, just shows uh, Shirley if you just take your mm -hmm. mouse there just on the, those speakers from the rafters that's what a that's what a big uh, group would bring in they're called line array speakers we're making uh, we're making allowances off of each of those end rafters so uh, that they could hoist those up so when we do get the bigger groups in mm -hmm each one of those would be capable of supporting a thousand pounds. Here's a, an example of what a symphony, 42 piece symphony orchestra might look like in the, in the theater. Um, oh wow, I just, can, just can't wait for the day where we can bring a symphony orchestra to Parksville. A beautiful sunset happening and hearing, listening to that music. So, a little bit further to 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 Councillor Wilson's uh, <clears throat> um, comment about the color. This would be the back wall, folks. Very important for acoustics. So on the bottom, the bottom black part you see, those are actually 48 inch wide panels, acoustic panels that go along the bottom. That really helps absorb those those bass sounds, bass drums, and and when Mr. Mayor plays his bass guitar, that that helps that. Uh, then above that, you'll see uh, you'll see cedar strips. Now those are one by ten cedar strips uh, from there to the ceiling. They're one inch wide and ten inches wide, and I think they're about ten feet up there. 
they are put in at different angles. So what they do is they diffuse the sound that comes back. If, if you just have a, a, a flat surface, if you don't diffuse that sound, the sound comes back from the monitors, hits that back wall, comes back and is picked up by the microphones a millisecond later, and it just muddies the sound. And, and we wanna have a facility that's both uh, good for performers and the audiences. So that's why that back wall is like that. And uh, it, will set, it will add some nice color too. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think about the roof, remove the roof and you're looking down, uh, carrying on with the acoustic treatments. Uh, these are the panels, acoustic panels, that would be in between all of these um, rafters. So they're hidden there, but they are doing a very important job of ensuring that the sound is absorbed where it needs to be absorbed and deflected where it needs to be deflected. I might add, when we first started with all this, <clears throat> we had envisioned a curtain that would look after a lot of these acoustic properties. There is not a curtain that'll stand up, withstand the weather outdoors. So we had budgeted in the original budget about $20,000 for the curtain. Uh, that will cover all these acoustic treatments. So it really is already, uh, already included in the budget. Mm -hmm. This is a front of house. It'll be about 60 feet out in front of the stage. And you'll see there a, a cement platform, raised cement platform, and just on the right side, that column is where all the wires and the electrical connections will come from the stage up in that secure cement portion there. And of course, everything you see on top of there is, is put on by the by the sound people if, if it's included. But mm -hmm. And then that little structure would be, like I say, located 60 feet out and just have that little protective roof over it. And this is just a, this is a grid for the lighting system. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you'll see the lights that are out in front of the uh, main beam. Those would be what a big group would, they would be uh, lights that a big group would bring in. We would not, uh, we would not foresee putting those up for security and other reasons. The light grid that you see behind the main beam uh, would be protected by the security screen. And I know Joe mentioned a few things about the security screen. Um, I think we, uh, I think we're going to be okay there. We, we've, we've talked to other outdoor venues that have outdoor security screens, such as Shermanus. I've seen that one. It's been there for years. So I don't think that's a problem. So this light grid, the, the 15 spotlights that we had budgeted uh, would go in the, on that back grid and they would uh, basically go up again for the season. They're good for humidity, uh, all those sorts of things. And then probably in the off season, they, along with the two base bin speakers, would be uh, put in the back of the theater for storage during the winter. Mm -hmm. So that provides an overview of, um, you know, the lighting, the sound, the dance floor, the choir risers, uh, what's included and what's not included in that uh, grant that we just received from BC Arts Council. So. We would like to ensure that we have support from uh, council for moving forward with that. Uh, we wanna ensure that this facility is used and that the lack of you know, equipment like this is not going to prevent use of that facility. Uh, we know from the troops and the groups that we've connected with that they need this equipment. The other thing that we'd like to seek uh, council support for Gosh, we keep asking for so much support. <laughs> We're needy. And we so very much value this. And this is such a major project that uh, we're grateful for your support on already. But we know that city staff have a, you know, a big decision, uh, lots of decisions to make around the operations for this facility. Uh, we want to support those decisions by collaborating with the city staff. We had a very preliminary conversation recently. Um, and what we'd like to propose is that uh, we will work with the city staff, subject to permission of mayor and council, work on an interim operations and management plan that would include the development of policy procedure, staffing, facility booking, rental rates, collection, et cetera. Um, and in developing the plan, uh, we would keep these goals in mind. We want to ensure that the superior outdoor venue is set at a reasonable rental rate to encourage use by all uh, at, 
all users of the performing arts uh, or all avenues, my apologies, of the performing arts. We want to ensure that it promotes and encourage, encourages arts and cultural pursuits from young to old. Uh, we wanna ensure the facility realizes its potential for usage. Uh, we wanna provide a high quality experience for performers and audiences alike. We wanna mitigate operational management staff time and labor costs for the city wherever we can. And we want to, as a group ourselves, it's not for profit, we wanna support that by raising funds through a series of ticketed performances to help offset operating and management costs. Um, we want to look at how that contributes to economic spinoff for our community, for our businesses in our region. And of course, we have to adhere to policies and bylaws. So collaborating with the city staff, we'd like to be able to do that with the goal of putting an interim plan together for the first year or two we know that this year during COVID and the vaccination schedule that needs time for rolling out that we're not you know, working on big events for this year, but that gives us some time to work on a plan that, uh, you know, th that allows for some time, hopefully for the city to work with us on that. And you know, folks, as, uh, as we get closer, the excitement is building out in the general public. And we have had a number of individuals that have stepped forward that have decades of experience in facility management, theater productions, concert management. Um, th there's invaluable resources out there if we choose to take advantage. And in my humble opinion, I, I think we'd be foolish not to do that. Th some of these folks have, have stepped forward with offers of their time and their expertise and and we would really like to engage them. They've been there and done that. And I, I think uh, it, it's a wonderful opportunity for the whole city to take advantage of that. So I'm just gonna let Cheryl finish up here, but but on behalf of myself, I just wanna thank the mayor and council and, and the staff, just everybody in the staff has been so helpful from, from square one and, and especially Joe, uh, we put a lot on his shoulders and, and he's doing a great job managing that. So, so folks, just on, on behalf of myself and the rest of Beach Fest, I just want to thank you personally. And I think Cheryl's got a few final comments and <laughs> done listening to us. <laughs> well, Lloyd has just said what I was going to say is then that is thank you to uh, the, your worship and council, as well as staff for the support. You know, it's uh, Lloyd's been incredibly busy working on this project and I've been supporting him and doing what I can to look at grants and various things. And it's been a, a real wonderful adventure. We're so excited to contribute to this for the benefit of our community. And uh, again, we're grateful for the city staff and, and mayor and council on the support here. We just really look forward to creating Vancouver Island's premier outdoor entertainment facility. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to start things off because just because I guess more than anything else, my, my concern here is we started out as a music stage and we've gone to the premier place of on Vancouver Island. We've incurred, we're proposing incurring constant expenses. There's huge expenses in what you're proposing. This is not Carnegie Hall. This is a stage that is there for people to use, for local organizations to use. We're, you're banking on, uh, you know, rock and roll or uh, bands to play and all that kind of stuff. All we were looking for, all I was looking for in the long run, was a place for local bands to play instead of playing in the food pavilion. I, I just have a real, real concern that we've gone like way over to the far side of this and it has gotten way out of control. First off, I've never played in a place that provides um, all of the sound system for you in an outdoor theater. I just, it, it's never, I've never seen that before. And, and yeah, maybe there is one or two of them, but not in a, a community the size of Parksville. Um, you know, this, the lighting systems that are being proposed, uh, you know, we have some concerns here. It, this, this isn't just the purchase of it. And I'm glad that you, you went out and looked for the $40,000 um, uh, grant. And, and yeah, it's only $17,000 more. But the cheapest part of all of this is buying it. 
where we're going to run in is, you know, we're going to have the depreciation values of all of this equipment. We're going to have ongoing maintenance and inspection costs. We're going to have uh, uh, to have expertise in how um, on setting it up. We're going to have to bring in audio visual people. And then it's going to cost staff to roll out these carpets for the dance groups or bring in the base, take out the base bins twice a year and, and bring them back in and, and hooking up the sound system so that it's done correctly. Those things all start to add up when you start looking at staff wages. And it's not like you can get volunteers to do that. This is going to have to be done by our city staff. So I look at this and as much as I would love to have this, as much as I see this being something, this just keeps growing and growing. And every time we sit down, it, there's more stuff being added onto it. And we got to stop. We got to we got to bring it into a place where the cost isn't anywhere near for the peripheral stuff. The, you guys have done an amazing job on the on the stage and on all of the other things up to that. It's all the extras that are being thrown in there now in the last few months that is where the costs are starting to grow. And you know we don't even know what those costs will be in the long run. But I. I, I just, I'm sorry, I, I can't support going on all of this stuff. I can, I love the building. I think the construction is going to be beautiful. I, I, all of those things are good. I'll even go with the sound at the back um, as, as part of it, the sound battens and everything at the back. Um, you know, do we need them in the ceiling? I don't know that for a fact, but I don't know what the cost of them are either. So, you know, I, I'll, I'd look at that, but the expertise that's required to ongoing is beyond that. It, it, to me, we've just gotten too large for Parksville for this. This is, I mean, last year we were in 2019, we we're happy to play in a park in a pavilion and everybody came out. We had six, 700 people coming out in an evening and Lloyd did a great job of organizing that. But now it's, it's gotten, you know, do we need that much to, to satisfy the population of Parksville? That, that's what I've got to say. So I'm going to pass it around. Is there any other comments or questions or statements? Councillor Greer. Thank you, Your Worship. And thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, to me, this is a fantastic venture uh, venue. And I think the idea that you, you people have is that it's going to create a lot more business for the city of Parksville, that you're going to be able, because of the facilities, you're going to be able to bring in very special bands and groups of people, which will ultimately prove to be successful as far as having more people come to town and spend more money. So I think you've done a phenomenal job. I, I don't know whether I can agree with the mayor on his uh, little frustration on getting too big. Um, I think it's better to get a little big right now than have to do it later. But anyways, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Councilor Praz and Councilor O'Brien. Thank you. And through the mayor to our uh, presenters there, Cheryl and Lloyd. Uh, I think I, uh, I agree more in line with, uh, with Councilor Greer here, just as far as uh, what it's going to be able to do for the community. Um, one of the things that comes to mind, though, for me is uh, we have a very busy summer season already, and I don't think it, it takes a lot to draw people in for that. So for me, I'm looking at more of like the, the shoulder seasons and kind of into the, how can it benefit in the off seasons. And you mentioned things like school groups, um, utilizing it, and of course, the school is in session uh, outside our busy, warmest season. So part of my concern, I guess, or not even concern, just question to you is, has there been much thought as to... Um, putting in things like infrared heaters into this space so that it can be, um, you know, used on the uh, weekend like, uh, or day like today when we're outside our warmest season, but it's definitely beautiful out. Uh, can't imagine dancers wanting to go um, perform in that kind of, uh, you know, frigid temperatures or people in an orchestra performing. I think it can be very distracting and hard to perform if it's chilly out. So um, I understand budget concerns in that, but has there been thoughts of uh, infrared heaters? Um, no, Adam, there have actually hasn't. It's a good idea, and it's something I think we could look at. If if I may just speak for a couple of minutes, folks, because because I understand where the mayor's coming from. We've obviously given this a lot of thought. Um, let me start by saying when we applied for the Island Coastal Economic Trust Grant, the only reason we got that was because of the amount of economic spinoff 
that could be realized uh, for, for the city and beyond for the Mid-Island. And when we, when we developed these plans, a lot of it had to do with that. Absolutely, the main purpose is to serve and promote our local uh, artists and cultural activities and musicians. Absolutely, it's, it, it's meant for that. Um, but it's meant for more than that too. And there are ways to raise funds. And, and when I mentioned about people stepping, stepping up that would help do sound and all these things, these, these folks have done it for years. They're, they're stepping forward, offering their time. I don't, you know, I, I don't see a lot of costs there. Our, I think our main, our, our main um, stance on the operation and maintenance costs, I truly believe in my heart that we can attract enough business, we can keep the rental rates reasonable for the locals, but by putting on three, two or three major events a year where you have a ticketed performance, you can bring in, we have enough room for 5,000 people, you know, you can have, you can charge people 10 or $20, anybody will come to hear a quality band for that, and all of a sudden you're generating 40 or 50 or $60,000 revenue, you know, uh, you, you get a, a good performer like that, you give them 20, that other 30 or $40,000 goes straight to the city to, to offset those operational costs. So mm -hmm. that's just some of my, what some of my first thoughts and I'm maybe Cheryl has more to, but you know, we, I really do not see this cost in the city a lot of money. I, I truly believe that, that yes, it will be used a lot, but I think it can generate a lot of revenue and a lot of revenue for area business. I just want to make mention too, is I think those comments are maybe more directed towards uh, what the mayor had mentioned, but um, I just thought if you could maybe respond to my questions about uh, as far as heaters, you mentioned that there wasn't any thought to it, uh, put into it quite yet, but um, could you give me your kind of thoughts on that now that I mentioned it? Because when I look at outdoor living spaces in our area, I know it's, they're, they're, you know, they're wonderful during the summertime, but in the off season, they're challenging to use. And if we don't consider that now, I think we could be pigeonholing ourselves as far as what this type of facility can really do for our community uh, outside the, the hot summer season. So is, is it a possibility to look at provisions, even if it's pre-wiring, but not mounting, but just having, you know, the, the, uh, the electrical available for in the future time when that kind of, you know, like I said, I'd suggest infrared heaters is a good outdoor uh, heating space, but can you uh, provide some kind of comment to that? I'm happy to provide a comment, Adam. I, and I, I commend you for thinking, you know, beyond the typical season, you know, from our experience with the beach festival and our entertainment, you know, summer concert series, uh, we were really thinking about a May to, you know, end of September period, um, you know, the weather, being quite favorable that at those times of the year and you know if the weather's not great it's difficult to get an audience to gather outside to watch something like that when we were talking about uh high schools i know that you know my experience has been the high schools are sometimes looking for uh outdoor settings to help hold their graduations and whatnot in june um, we know that the dance troops and, and whatnot that would like to perform, you know, they're pretty active. So as a performer, um, you know, they're not probably wouldn't want to perform in January, February, uh, outdoor on the stage, but May, June, that would be a time where you could get groups like Highland Dance and dance troops and, and pretty active types of um, performances out there. And I just wanted to add as well, um, to Lloyd's comments that in seeking equipment for the stage, we've not at all veered from the original purpose of the stage. Um, we always wanted to have a symphony orchestra there and a dance troops, and we always wanted to have small, medium and larger bands there. Uh, so, you know, we, with all due respect to the considerations of the future for operations and maintenance, I think we can be uh, is resourceful and creative. And as a Beach Festival Society, I'm confident in saying that Beach Festival Society would be more than happy to look at how it can contribute on an annual basis based on the success of our uh, major events to contribute to some of the maintenance of equipment or contribute to the operations of events. So we'd like to be able to engage in more conversation related to that. Councillor O'Brien. 
Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thanks to Lloyd and Cheryl for your, your presentation. I, I think it shows incredible vision, uh, in, in vision on what kind of an economic driver this, this can be for not just Parksville, but for the entire uh, region of the area. This, this as you have described it, uh, with all the equipment in place and so forth, is going to be like a community center gathering place for all of us here, uh, actually for mid Vancouver Island. You call it the premier uh, center. Well, it is going to be, it's going to be the, the uh, center for Vancouver Island. So I applaud you on that. The last thing I'd want to ha see happen to this is a beautiful facility being built and sitting empty. That would break my heart because the thing is you guys have worked so hard on this. So the one thing I can say is that seeing your presentation here, and I've said it before as liaison before, I've never seen such a well-organized and managed uh, group as the Beach Festival Society. You think of everything and even those things that nobody else would think about. You, you've you run the Beach Festival Society, proven its success over and over again. So I'm going to defer to your abilities and to your strengths and talents that you've presented already to the community. You've done well. And I hope that if you bring that same expertise to this performing arts theater in the park, I believe it will be a success. And I'm really relying on you to do that because you, you, you do what you do very well, and, and I'm very much appreciative of it. I'm, I'm very happy to, to support all of the, what you're asking for. I like the fact that you're looking ahead for uh, operations and management on how it's going to do. Uh, Lloyd has come up with an idea with a bunch of people in the area that can provide such amazing expertise, and these are people that know what they're doing. They're going to help ensure that success, and they're going to help, help to make sure it's done right. because. It's not a learning curve for these people because these people have spent their whole lives uh, uh, running uh, performing arts theaters and in music backgrounds and everything else. They've got the expertise. We don't have to learn all already because they're bringing it. And I'm, I'm happy that they're they're willing to work with us on it. So um, yeah, I, I'm supporting what you're doing. I, I continue to support your application for as many more grants. And if we can find any grants that we think is applicable, we're gonna be forwarding it to you as well. But at the same time, thank, thanks for this. I, th I think you're on the right track. Great job. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, through your worship. So Councillor Ryan said it all. It, I totally support this. I think it's a, a fabulous job that you've done on this. And as far as the acoustical baffles, yes, they're needed for, for uh, a, an enjoyable experience for everybody. So I love the color, Lloyd. The natural color, yes. I was thinking about the side of the building as well or something perhaps bright and fun. But anyway, I, I totally support this and I agree that uh, it will bring in lots of uh, revenue for the city, lots of tourism and, and business local for, uh, you know, support for our local businesses. So well, well done. Thank you. Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you, Lloyd and Cheryl. Um, I can recall the first drafts for what was the stage. I remember going out into the audience with, with uh, a sand bucket and collecting dollars and everything for some of the, the um, performances and that, that uh, happened down in the park. And I, I know that the 17,000 uh, will be easily um, found. Um, I'm really impressed that you incorporated the, the dampening and the sound baffles and the absorption and the deflections and that because as much as I absolutely love music, we know that that not everyone wants to, to hear different things throughout the year. Um, so I'm respectful of that. I know that the rental rates and moving forward, you know, COVID has had so many um, disappointing and aspects of, and of everything, but uh, 2020 and 2021 have definitely provided the time and the grants and the construction and everything that's um, 
we've needed and that to accomplish the, the stage this year. And so I'm very, very, very looking forward to 2022 when we'll be able to have that stage booked every, every week from, from May till into September. And, and I know that um, people come and go um, in boards and societies and that. And I, I know that you have new people on board and, um, and we've lost some as well. But um, what Beach Fest does for this community is, is really so amazing. And the gate ambassadors and all the other different groups that are in this community that you give back to, I, um, my, my heart just, <laughs> um, you, you know how much I love, uh, love the Beach Fest group and everything. Um, I'm I'm really happy that we did get that you did get the forty thousand for outfitting the stage, but um, Mayor Main did did raise some some very valid points, and and I'm going to have to be aware of that um, when we get together in our next meeting and that. But at this point in time, I thank you so much for the presentation, and I I really do hope that uh, we had some people watching in the uh, Zoom world and online and everything today and that uh, we will move forward. Thank you. Councillor Chandler. Thank you uh, through your worship to um, uh, Lloyd and Cheryl. Thank you very much for your presentation. And, and uh, we need this. We need this uh, really badly in our, our city. I think this is gonna be a, a huge piece of, um, of future going forward for us both economically and, uh, and just, um, you know, just something to really uh, hang our hat on, on the arts and, and uh, performance community. I think it's gonna be fantastic. Uh, I thank you so much for all of the great work you do in the city, what they've done to work with you on this. But I think mostly, you know, just uh, to let you know, I've lived in several communities uh, throughout my uh, career um, in the sales and food industry and so on. And one of the things that I've seen is, is the, just such an amazing association that you have uh, behind you and what you do for the community with all the other uh, support that you give to some of the other smaller charities is unbelievable. So um, I've, I've never seen a better run society to be truthful. So thank you so much. Thank you. Just to clarify a few points, if I may, first off, I totally 100% support the construction of the building and, and the premise that it's there. What I have a problem with is the add-ons that are continually being uh, put in, for example, the equipment. We don't know, the tenders haven't even been issued yet. We've made a number of massive changes to the, to the building. My suggestion is, is that we don't know what the cost of this construction is going to be. We have a finite amount of money that's here. And before we start throwing more expense onto this building, why aren't we looking and say, all right, let's get the, let's get the, um, the tenders in, let's look at it. And if we're $500,000 over budget at that point in time, then you know we, we aren't gonna spend the time and effort on, on equipment. If we're $300,000 under budget and we have that finance available, then that might be a different, different subject altogether. As far as things, uh, you know, needing these, I've been probably three, four, maybe even five times to Qualicum Beach in the winter time when they, in their um, center, where they have the orchestra playing there. They don't have a sound system that's provided by uh, the, the, uh, by the, the center. They have, actually they don't have anything other than a, a speakers for the, for the uh, conductor. But, you know, I'm not sure what we're looking for. Are we looking for trying to bring in the Rolling Stones? Or are we looking for trying to bring in local groups? Are we looking for trying to bring in, uh, you know, the, Phil the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra? Or are we looking for a local group to come in and play on this stage? That's the parts that I've got a concern about. I think we've, we've yeah, it'd be nice to say we're gonna draw all these people in, but the reasonableness of it says that perhaps not. And then we've invested this, we've got all the ongoing expense and everything into it. I would love to be totally wrong. I would love 
for me to be absolutely incorrect in my assumptions that we're going to end up spending all this money and it's not going to be much different as far as what we're attracting than what we would if we didn't spend the money on this sound system. So I emphasize caution on this. I know where it's going. It's, it's pretty obvious. Um, but you know what? I'm still not going to support the purchase of the equipment and, and just out of principle. I do support without a doubt. And if anybody doesn't know that there's something wrong, the, the Beach Fest Society and all the things that they do, I, I think they're just wonderful people and they bust their butt to, to make everything happen. So, you know, from that point, this is not a reflection on that. This is a reflection on where we've gone from here. And, and that's my point. Councillor Wilson, then we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you, Your Worship. So just a, just a clarification. The $40,000, are you required to purchase the equipment with that $40,000, Cheryl? Uh, thank you, um, Mayor Will, or uh, sorry, Councillor Wilson. Um, so I, a point of clarification on that, that those funds are have nothing to do with the construction. This is just funds outside and beyond the construction budget uh, to uh, support purchase of risers, dance floor, lighting, and a PA system with speakers, et cetera. Um, that, those components are not at all included in the construction budget. So adding the, this equipment has nothing to do with the construction. So we've not veered the course from the original grant proposals on either the ice tea grant or the federal grant. Nothing has changed. The original concept on what the purpose of the stage is for is not adjusted. We always intend it for it to be wide range of views from symphonies to rock bands to uh, two band member jazz band from the KSS to uh, theater to uh, an indigenous group performance. Uh, we have not veered the course whatsoever. And, you know, I say this not, not to, um, you know, challenge Mayor Maine, but I just want clarification that us looking at the equipment is really about ensuring that the facility can be used by various groups that cannot afford to bring in risers and a dance floor and to have a microphone. Um, and speakers that will project. It's as simple as that. So um, we are required if we are to use the $40,000 BC Arts grant on what it is that we're planning to use it for it is to use it for that purpose. Thank you. Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I'm of the philosophy here of uh, build it and they, they will come and we have to do it right. And I believe that this is a, a, a good move. I'd like to propose a motion at this time uh, that council offer their support uh, as per the plan that uh, uh, Beach Fest Society has put forward to us today and to move forward with it as per their description of all equipment as they've noted. I need a seconder, Councillor Wilson. Go ahead. Sorry, if I'm if I may, Your Worship. Um, so is that just for the forty thousand dollars, or what about the seventeen thousand dollar extra? Is that is just to clarify? Sorry, if I may, your um, your motion is it just supporting the they? Uh, I believe they already have the forty thousand. Um, so can I just clarify if that motion is to include additional money from the city? At at this time, it would be supporting and endorsing their plan as as it is and not with any specific dollar uh, plan in, in mind that they would um, you know, do what they can to do their own fundraising up until this time, but to do, to, to it's, it's, I guess, to endorse their vision of the spending package for all the acoustic panels and everything, well, just as they've described. Okay, it's so you. many things I can't even- Sure, I get what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, that's it, it's the endorsing the whole plan. Okay, thank you. Yes. Let me just- Cheryl, you okay with his proposal? Yes, um, 
the arts grant is based on based on us being able to contribute the remainder and so we're not asking for funds from the city to comprise the remainder of that equipment purchase seconded by it was councillor wilson all right i'll call the vote all those in favor and opposed Thank you. Thank you very much, folks. Appreciate it. I know you guys have done a t an awful lot of work on this and it's much appreciated by the city. Even, even though we may not agree on all of the things, I think you've done a great job. Thank you, Thank you. very, very much. Thank you. All right, moving right along then. Next, Mrs. Tardiff, are you there? There she is. I am your worship. Your report. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this report, uh, which outlines engagement opportunities for your consideration. There are many ways in which council can engage with residents, albeit somewhat limited now because of COVID restrictions on in-person gatherings. However, I hope this report will provide council with some options. Although we hopefully, I seem to be saying hope a lot, although we hopefully will be in a post-pandemic environment soon, it may be sometime before residents are comfortable meeting in person um, or meeting in anything other than small groups, which is why this report recognizes the need for a hybrid of virtual and in-person events for some time. Our challenges are not unique. There is I don't think there is one single or one right or wrong solution. Perhaps this will be more of a trial and error as we determine how residents are most comfortable engaging with us. Each engagement event will require some, some pretty strategic pre-planning and a communications plan to ensure that residents are aware. Residents will require a clear understanding of why the city is asking them to engage we would outline expectations as well as provide a platform for meaningful dialogue and results. My report is provided uh, and the recommendation is as per the agenda. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I'm just wondering if I could add to that list or if this is the time to add to that list. Of suggestions. I'm sorry. Yeah, we're um, not not right now. Not right now because we're just receiving the report. Okay, thank you. A motion to receive. Yes, Councillor O'Brien, seconded by Councillor Fraz. All those in favor of receiving, carried. Now, do you have a motion that you would like to? Thank you, Your Worship. So there are just a couple of things that I think um, Deb's put a, a great list together. But when it comes to the downtown revite, I was thinking of uh, either an adjunct to that or perhaps another um, topic that might run um, simultaneous to that discussion would be to add something about transportation, parking, perhaps bike lanes, that sort of um, idea so that people, I know that getting around town for sure, especially on bicycles is kind of difficult. So that might be another a topic. And the other one that I wondered about um, that we might consider or might be of interest would be the discussion about Oceanside, Parksville boundaries, RDN, and that sort of issue as to whether how people feel about that topic. Thank you. Made note, no, I, I think we don't need a motion for that. If I'm not mistaken, we'll just move it, just add it to the list. Is that all right uh, with you, Ms. Tardif? Yes, it is your worship. Thank you, Councillor Fraz. See, uh, perhaps this would have been better just as a discussion under the motion received because uh, I don't have a motion I'm moving right now, but I have uh, some comments and questions kind of to staff. So 
Um, okay. I know we already voted on that, but if you may, if you entertain the comments and questions. No, yes, yes, please. So just that, report. So. Right now, so. Uh, so for me, when a discussion uh, uh, regarding a town hall, kind of the, the, the premise of it is to have uh, an avenue where we can have a two-way dialogue between council and, uh, uh, and the community, uh, which is different than what we have during council meetings where you know, our discussions amongst ourselves and where they can view or even committee of the holes, which is more or less the same type of a thing in that regard. Um, I see in, in through this, there's challenges that uh, need to be addressed, things like getting the um, proper training for staff so we know what kind of platforms to use. Uh, but I don't know exactly what that ask would be as far as what kind of training. Like if we were to make a motion then to say, let's provide staff with the right training, what is it that's needed in that regard? Um, and then addressing the part of it that's saying like how many we could host in that. Uh, in my opinion, having two a month, I think is a little bit on the, on the high end of it, recognizing the demands that it puts on staff and the preparing agendas and topics and so on. I think my vision about that would be uh, one a month at most, or even once every two to three months type of thing, just so that it's part of our communication strategy is having a, you know, the town hall there and really is kind of starting small. So this could be something that goes on into the future. I think what we have with the coffee with the mayor right now is kind of that premise of having a town hall, but, but if we could open up to all the council and more uh, community members rather than just one-on-one. -on -one. So those are my thoughts. And I guess the question then with staff would be, what is it that you're needing to kind of move things forward? What kind of training would it be? Recognizing that virtual component is, is what would be required right now. If I, I may, Your Worship, um, we don't presume to know everything. I'm not sure exactly what that training will involve at this point. Um, I've been doing a fair bit of re research on, on and there are many different ways. And I think that's why I started by saying it will be a bit of uh, trial and error um, in order to get a good balance between, between speakers and engagement. You know, are we looking at just doing Zoom? Are we looking at doing Zoom and, and perhaps um, some people in the forum? Um, and that would be presenters. I think there has to be, um, we have to look at, at how long this goes for. Is it 60 minutes? Is it, um, is it 90 minutes? And then in which case we break it up with some polls or maybe some breakout rooms. So for staff, um, and I, I'm just speaking for myself and the people who I work with, we haven't actually we may have attended things like this, but we actually haven't um, organized it and, and, and hosted it. So that's, I think, what we have to learn. And then I think there's also the IT component and, and I would defer to the CAO as to what would be involved there. Go ahead. Um, if I may, Your Worship, I, I think that we've all been trying to you know, figure out the best ways to engage as COVID has changed everything for us. What uh, the communications manager and myself talked about was sort of a, a four to six month plan while things are still very limited, but then gradually expecting that things would open up. Um, as was mentioned, maybe being able to have eight to 10 people in person and then have a hybrid where there's some folks, um, you know, participating from elsewhere. One of the things that we mentioned is if we're doing something, say a, a town hall that's, um, got breakout groups or, or even just um, keeping track of the facilitated discussion, we would need several, almost all of our senior team to kind of be on deck to support that or, or several people. Um, I participated in the CAO forum virtually just uh, last week and it was very, very well done, but I know there was a huge amount of work that went into it. And I think there are consultants or communications um, folks who work for places like the LGMA and, and others that can, can help us out, but obviously we have to kind of pay for that time and then have them show us how do you set up a breakout room? What kind of questions are, are helpful to ask people? How do you do the polling um, on the screen? And then there's ways that you can, you know, have people voting as well. So you can show the, um, like the, the running tally of, of what's happening. And, and we just, we haven't been able, we'd have to test it out ourselves and, and make sure that it works because there's nothing worse than, you know, being told you're going to go to a breakout room and then sitting there waiting and you're not in a breakout room and then nobody cares anymore because they're all in the breakout room. And so we just want to make sure that we're not creating more frustration for people who are 
wanting to participate effectively. And then the biggest challenge that we were told about from folks who've organized these things is really the user at the other end. So making sure that, you know, our system might work fine, but what do you do to set people up for success at home, especially if, if folks are working on different platforms? Um, we've been told Teams isn't the best to use, although that works quite well for us. But if you don't have 365 on your newer computer, you know, good luck. So I think it's just figuring out some of those subtle things, given our demographic, given our Wi-Fi speeds. We just don't want to do something that makes people more mad at us because they can't get into the, to the chat or whatever. So I think they'll have to bear with us a little bit on, on some of it. But if we can, um, I guess, get some direction from Council on the priority, what topics initially would you really like to see? What format, as um, Ms. Tardif is saying, like, are you looking at, you know, a one hour town hall? Um, and then we also have to kind of think what's the best success for you. Like if we just open it up and say, okay, everyone come and talk to us about downtown. What is that going to actually achieve for us? Like we have to record some kind of actions or, you know, direction from people. We're probably best to have a bit of an introduction or a staff report or a report from a counselor with interest in that field or that topic, um, just to kind of guide the conversation to where you want it to be. So I think if we, if we have direction from you on your key priorities, we can maybe pick one start with it, see what we don't like, do a bit of an adjustment after. Um, and I think Deb has provided kind of some, what we think is manageable in terms of a, a variety of things. So somebody could participate in a conversation with, with the mayor. Um, then they could also participate in a conversation with all of council on downtown issues. And then they could maybe participate in a survey. So we kind of give people a few things that they could do maybe each month. Um, but I think what we just want to understand better is where you want us to start and what topics are you, do you really think people want to start talking to you about and what you've heard from your constituents in terms of their ability and their desire to, you know, is everybody saying, I wish I could get on Zoom with you guys <laughs> or, you know, what are you hearing? Fair enough. Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I, I echo what uh, Councillor Friles was uh, mentioning anyways. We're, we're lacking the two-way conversation. And, and, and that's, that's what we're all feeling right now. And I think the, the public are feeling it as well uh, because of this. But I, I think there's light at the end of the tunnel here, folks. And I think that we're, we're going to come out of this. So what our CAO has just described is to try and make Zoom friendly and, and, and workable. And I was on a couple of those Zoom calls where they had the breakout rooms and it was more frustrating and I was so sorry I even signed up for it. It was just not worth it. We, and so I, I think it, if we want to have some kind of engagement process for the next, like say five months, and I believe in five months we're going to be out of this and we're going to be back to normal. But in the, in, in, for the next five months, and I agree with Councillor Fraz, that we, we, we have to get on with this. But the thing is, is that I'm saying go back to old school for five months. And if we go into, I know it's not one-on-one -on -one with, with people, but going on the survey type of thing, the survey out there and, and you know, like the people that talk to me, they, they, they know something about Zoom, but they don't get it, you know? So, so they say, if you put something in the paper, you know, the newspaper or something, give it to me and I can fill it in. And then your opinions on, on the things, and then they send it back or they drop it off or whatever, then our staff have to tell you. But there's, there's our actions there that gives us the feedback. So I, I, I'm only suggesting for the next five months, we go old school on, on, a, on a subject that we can all agree on that needs, needs that would work with that premise. I totally get the idea of the proper town halls and we'll be able to do that. So I'm just thinking for a timeline here, we're doing this. Um, I think we can go old school for now because what you're saying, Zoom is going to have a whole bunch of experts that come in, come in, and I'm afraid it's only going to be for a three three months period. I'm just going to four months, and it's going to be gone. Yeah, me too. I, I I appreciate that. And the only other question I had for our CAO, um, one one of the topics uh, that uh, Debbie's brought up. Thank you very much. Uh, was downtown revite, and were we not having a committee of the whole? meeting with with with, with uh, the council sometime in march or something or are we talking the same thing? like when i look at downtown revite i'm i was thinking that downtown revite traffic slowdown and economic um improvement for the downtown area uh, you know traffic slowdowns and everything 
that's what I saw coming in. So I was really excited that Debbie's got that on there, if that's what it is, or we're having a separate committee of the whole first. That's my question. Um, if I may, Your Worship, uh, through you to Councillor Brian, we have it on our books to have that. Um, there was a motion that was put forward with some specifics on a downtown uh, committee of the whole, but we had discussed delaying it until COVID was over so we could have it in person. But what uh, is being offered by staff now is basically bringing that back to a virtual format. It would probably have to be condensed to a specific thing rather than, um, I think we had parking, uh, beautification, um, economic downtown revitalization. There was a whole bunch of different things in one in that one resolution, but for we're kind of trying to bring it back to you sooner than waiting five months um, until we can do it in person. But I think it would have to be a little bit more focused if we're doing it virtually. That was the plan. Oh, okay. As a follow-up, if I may, Your Worship, um, would would council still be able to do a committee of the whole of that of the whole big package? Oh yeah. That's probably what uh, you're saying. Yeah, okay. that's on yeah. that's just been deferred. It's on our work plan, but it's just been deferred until we could do it in person. For now. Until the big, like, like this? Like this. Um no, what we were hoping was like with the full audience, kind of like we did our committees of the whole at the beginning of your term on each of the strategic. Oh, I see. Sectors. Yes. So that's, even, even better, but if not, you know, that but we could time. do a small piece. Yes. Before then, if you wish. Thank you. Just, just to touch base on that, I'll, I'll get to you in a second, Councillor Wilson, if, if you don't mind. I think it would be really good if we sat down as a committee of the whole, we can open it up to the public so they can watch, but us to have a conversation on what we see. And it, is there you know, a common ground that we're all looking to achieve or are we all looking to achieve you know, six lane highways down through the center of town or are we looking at, you know, uh, a bike lane, you know, or something in the middle. We need to sit down and the, and the seven of us have that conversation with staff. And I think we could do that in a relatively near um, time period. We can call a special committee of the whole meeting, if I'm not mistaken, we should be able to. Uh, for downtown, for the downtown core, because we can have that conversation. Yeah. And you know, if it lasts for a couple of hours, we at least get, and now, then we, that's kind of the catapult to take us to the next step, if, if, if it works. Uh, to me, that makes sense to, to do that. Okay, Councillor Wilson and then Councillor Press. Thank you, Your Worship. So that, that answers some of my uh, issue is bringing that motion forward. I'd be thrilled if we could do that. And the other um, thing we could do to our CAO is to, um, people can actually make comments uh, and ask questions while we're having that right in, in this forum, which would be helpful. So we get automatic feedback from them. The other thing I was thinking about too um, is that force for De for our Deb Tardif, uh, I should call you our manager of communications, but Deb, um, thinking about some of those other topics that we have on there, given that we are under these uh, COVID rules that we have right now and how limited we are, I'm thinking that perhaps a presentation style, uh, a presentation of, of sorts would help people to understand what we're what we're trying to convey and and the other thing is can we hold some of these meetings outside come summer the, the, the amphitheater is if it gets built well no i'm a not great I'm, sound system there <laughs> i'm thinking right out here um I, go ahead go ahead if i may your worship um we are looking at things outside you'll see that um we hope to do maybe a parks and open space discussion with uh, the parks and open space committee um, but I think you you have to have some kind of introduction at any event to tell people a little bit of the background and tell them what you want them, like what you want to know from them or what you want them to to, to tell you, I guess. Um, so I think it's important to have some of that in advance, even just a short memo that lets them know what's going on. Here's the background documents you can look at, and here's what we're hoping to achieve with this event. Councillor Fraz, and then I'm going to make one last comment, and then we'll call it a yeah, thanks. Um, this is, I guess, in response to a little bit of uh, Councillor Brian's comments, just on the, uh, you know, where things are going the next five months and that. 
But I think about with the Zoom training, I do think it is important that we get proficient to how to use Zoom. We've, we've been kind of hopping along, getting by, I think needing what we need to know. But I think if we can get to a point where we know as much as possible about how to use these functions, it's going to serve us better in the future. Uh, I, I don't think we can continue holding out, waiting for things to return back to how they were, um, you know, a couple of years ago. We're, we're 12 months into the two weeks of flattening the curve now. And so I don't really believe that in five months from now, it's, you know, constantly that carrot on a stick type of thing. It's just a little more, just a little more, just a little more. I think we need to step into the future and realize that Zoom is always going to be a tool that we can utilize. And if we train our staff, we can maybe um, couple it to even when we have in person to having the online portion, because we don't know if people are going to be comfortable to return to the forum just because we say the doors are open now. So I'd like to see the Zoom training uh, go forward for staff, uh, whatever that's going to entail. Um, Right now we've hosted things from our EMO, our emergency management Oceanside. They've done online things where they've invited in 50 people and had these kind of discussions and that. So that's kind of the premise of what I think how this could, could uh, operate. Um, in that respect, we have already kind of tested it. We don't need to start off going as big as possible. Maybe stay as small as possible. Limit it just like we structured with them. 50 people, uh, you know, a, a topic, one individual topic. And as you suggested, bring us some background information. Part of where this came from for me of bringing up this issue with town hall was things like the community center. I realized we're getting a bunch of emails and people not sure, uh, really not working with the best information um, and having to constantly one-on-one -on -one address those types of, of, uh, of things. This is in a way where we can, we can bring everyone in the fold all at once. Um, but you know, whether it's the pool, just whatever's kind of like our current event that we're dealing with, because this is really from the residents side of things, not our view, not our, you know, yes, downtown, what it's going to look like in the future. That's kind of our goals and that type of thing. But this should really be resident geared to like, what is it that we're getting emails from or what kind of topics are people's tops of mind right now? It's the pool. So as far as topics we should address, I think it should be the pool. Let's tackle it and get to it as soon as possible instead of waiting for it to, you know, people to really uh, exasperate their concerns before we address them. So I guess I'm back to asking the two, if we were going to advance staff in a training for Zoom, is, or is it a, a, you know, just a budgetary amount that we're looking to do? Or is there certain providers that we should be? Or how would you evolve your Zoom training? Because that's what I'd like to move as a motion to get staff going in that direction. So if I may, Your Worship, uh, through you to Councillor Faz, I think it's a, definitely a budget item. Um, although we do have probably some funds in our operation um, operational budgets, but it's really just the priority. So we would have to pull some of our senior team, obviously, away from their um, other priorities. And then I think just having a sense of what it is exactly, like if we were looking at doing something like the EMO, that's a fairly minimal, um, we don't really need new breakout room ideas or poll issues. Um, you know, we can kind of start basic and, and maybe if council could let us know if for April, you would want us to try something like the EMO format for the pool, then we can certainly get that going. And then my, we can all look for, um, you know, somebody, an IT guru or whatever to come and, and give us a session on the Zoom stuff, but at least we're moving it forward kind of while we're waiting. Okay, last, I mean, time, around. last time around then. So maybe that could just be it for the pool and we can keep it, maybe it's something as simple as like, where are the, you know, the, the site plan or the, the piece of property that, you know, that type of a thing. Cause I don't think a lot of people have a clear idea on that. Um, just as something as simple as that. I don't think it needs to be breakout rooms. We don't need to add too much. If we could figure out uh, maybe a, a polling function on it, uh, just so we can get direct feedback from the people that are attending it, that I think could be very valuable. I think just summarize this reason the, uh, manager of communications is, did this was because we asked her to put together a plan for the next number of items to talk about. And I think that's where, where she's at. She's saying, here you are, here's what it's going to take. And, you know, are we ready to go forward? I think that, you know, the list is far too long for us at this point in time. We need to break it down. Let's just do two items and call it a day and see how they work. The end of the first item, we'll know if the second item is going to work. And if the second item works, then we're ready with the third one. And we can just keep going month after month. And I agree, once a month is probably more than enough because it's way too much to try to do it every two weeks. So let's, for now, pick two items and say, that's it. 
go crazy, Deb, you know, get yourself set up on this and let's, let's set two dates and, and we go. I, to me, that just makes sense. And um, I would like to propose the, 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 the two most common ones that would be up for discussion would be the pool and for the uh, PCC and put those out on the, on the, on the floor and, and have the conversation. I'll qualify the PCC because of, uh, if there's any kinds of discussions we may not be able to have at this point in time, so. Do, I'm sorry. We, we have the information on the piece on the pool by April. Right. If I may, Your Worship, um, if, if you're just looking to kind of explain uh, the background and the, the site and some of the preliminary information on the pool, we're ready to go with that. It's all on the um, yeah. Let's Talk Parksville site. I think what's um, what I'm hearing from Council is that that isn't for everybody. Not everybody wants to sit down at their computer and read it. So if there's a, a presentation with that. visuals and things, that's definitely doable in April. Well, in April, I guess it's already middle of March. Um, and then the other item that we could also do is um, we should know the information on the grant for the daycare funding by May. So we could do, that could be the second topic, explaining council's vision for that and, and moving okay. that one forward. Is everybody kind of, we, there's no motion on the table, just a nod of heads would probably be a, a good one. All right, there you go. We okay with that, Deb? Yes, um, if I may, Your Worship, we did the emergency management Oceanside workshop sessions and we did, I think we've now down, done six altogether. And what we did is we started out with 15 people. We found we could work with 25 or 30, um, but we had to be able to provide a couple of dates because who knew, but they filled up very quickly. So we might want to keep that in the back of our mind. Um, if we pick one for the, for the pool and it fills up, we need to be able to offer a second date. And, right. and, and part of that we'll be deciding if 50 is a magic number. The other thing that um, I just throw out that we really need to do, I need to do better at as we move into this is educating our audience as to how to use Zoom, because it's really frustrating for some people who, who are more proficient when you have somebody wandering around their living room with the, you know, with the microphone still turned on, which is what was happening with um, the emo sessions. So it, it's, it's kind of two parts, but I would like to see us offer, um, at least have a, a second date as a backup if the first one fills, once once I have a better idea of whether, you know, Thank 30 you. is manageable or 50. <laughs> Thank you.
We know. I now know my limitation is four and a half hours. <laughs> This. Yeah. Councillor Greer. Yeah, okay, thank you. This is Councillor O'Brien's fault. There is absolutely no doubt about this. At the beginning of the meeting, he says, oh, there's hardly anything on the agenda today. <laughs> You'll stay as long as you're told. <laughs> did you um, did you do what I asked you to do? Good, good. Thank you. Good. Yeah, it is cool. That's it's supposed to be. Yeah. All right. Let's. Oh, we're waiting for Marilyn. <laughs> Mrs. Weeks, you're you're away. As soon as uh, comes, well, you, you can start on this one. This is. Do I have to do a resolution to appoint them? Doug and Alan. Um, oh, I will say it. <laughs> All right, let's go. Make me wait for all this time. <laughs> Thank you. Ready? Um, make sure I'm on the right one. Uh, so this is for the spring grant and aid application. So this report is submitted in accordance with the city's grant and aid policy. Council's requested to appoint two councillors to serve as a grant and aid select committee to review applications for financial assistance from community groups and organizations and the recommendations as per the council agenda. Thank you. I need a motion to uh, for all three recommendations. Councillor O'Brien, seconded by Councillor Wilson. All those in favor? Opposed, it's carried. And just as a note, Councillor Greer and Councillor O'Brien are to be appointed as the grants and aid. They have the tightest hold on the purse strings for that. <laughs> Mrs. Weeks, please. Uh, so the purpose of this report is to set the date and time for the parcel tax review panel in order th to authenticate the 2021 parcel tax rolls for water, sewer, and regional parks as required under the community charter and the recommendations as per the council agenda. I need a mover and a seconder for that. Moved by Councilor Greer, second by Councilor Wilson. Any comments? I will bite my tongue while I vote in favor of the regional parks one. <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Final adoption the housing agreement authorization bylaw 2021 number 1568. Housing agreement authorization for 360, 364, 368 Molliette Street South and 371, 383, and 389 Alberni Highway. I need a mover and a second. A move by Councillor Chandler, second by Councillor Wilson. Discussion? Councillor Wilson? Thank you, Your Worship. So I just have a, a clarification I wouldn't mind getting on this. In the agreement, um, the affordable housing units set aside are 77 for affordable out of 87, and they're asking a DCC waiver for the entire uh, project for the entire building. So I believe this question may go to um, our director of planning help me answer that. Director of Planning, comments? Certainly, if I may, Your Worship, through to Councillor Wilson, the waiver would only be for the 77 units. For the floor area of the 77 units, that's what would be waived at the time that the building permit is applied for. So it's prorated. Thank you. Okay, then I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, it's carried, thank you. Motions from previous meeting. Councillor Fraz, letter of support for the Corporation of the City of Vernon. You've moved and seconded it. 
Yeah, so I want to move this uh, motion here. I'll just make comment though that you can strike out the last line that it says that this letter be forwarded to all BC. Uh, sorry if my mic wasn't on there. You can strike out the last line that says this letter be forwarded to all BC municipalities asking to write their support as well as this is, uh, that was a request from uh, the city of Vernon, um, but I'm not looking to us to solicit any support from anyone else just to endorse the city of Vernon's request. I see. All right. I need a seconder for this. Councillor Wilson, discussion. Councillor Greer. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yes, I cannot support this motion. This is a moral and social issue that is not in our mandate. Our mandate is simple, spending tax dollars wisely, looking after roads, water, sewers, development in the city, parks, sports, cultural facilities, community safety, period. I don't think the taxpayers in Parksville want to pay for everyone's sexual encounters. We are at a very dangerous time with the government's controlling our lives through this pandemic. The last thing we should be doing is asking them to take control of other aspects of our life. These things lead us to another spike in the democratic coffin. We should not depend on big government to give us free health care, free education, guaranteed wages, et cetera, et cetera, which is what they want full control. Nothing is free except our freedom, which is being challenged. We must keep our independence. Right now, we must focus on our responsibilities here in the city and be more accountable for our own lives. Okay, any other comments? Count, count. Councillor Fraz first. Is it your, is your motion? Thank you. Just going to say, I brought forward this motion as it uh, came before us as correspondence a couple of meetings ago. And uh, I think we had meant to discuss it at the time, uh, but unfortunately, uh, by the time our meeting ended, I think it was kind of forgotten about. But I did have um, some people in our community reach out to me asking, hey, what's, uh, what's going on with that? Does that motion not go forward? Do you plan to bring it back? Uh, so on their behalf, I am bringing it forward here. I think it deserves to be um, discussed here. I agree with Councillor Greer that while this isn't within um, typically what we do, it's not our mandate of what we do, in fact, what we do as a municipality here, uh, but I do see a benefit to this. Um, parenthood is it's a wonderful thing that we uh, can embrace in life, but unfortunately when it's, when it's not planned, uh, it can be very disruptive and challenging to people as well. So I think when we, we see how we, we do have things like condoms and vasectomies covered in our um, medical service plan, but I think it should be extended to cover uh, things like birth control and prescription contraception. It supports not just women, but just uh, all parents uh, around. And, you know, and my personal opinion is that it probably perhaps doesn't even go far enough. I, I think things like male birth control is something that's going to be in the future. Uh, you know, there's efforts towards that and, um, you know, that's when I really see support for parents is going to really be fulsome. And, you know, even things like uh, feminine hygiene products, I, I think it's, uh, that should also be covered under our medical service plan too. It's, it's not fair that they have to go and uh, um, pay for these types of products that they require. So I, I do support it. I think that what we're, what it's asking for here is just a letter of support. It's endorsing what the city of Vernon has done. We don't have to do anything more than, than simply show our support. Uh, and because of that, I, it's, it's an area that I'd like to, to show that kind of leadership in. And I hope the rest of council can support it. But I do understand positions like Councillor Greer, who is opposed to it. Any other comments? The only caution I, the only caution I have on, on this, and it's, I think it's a great idea. And I think that the province should step up to the table. The problem is, is that for the last 20 odd months, we have maintained and hold firm with the fact that we don't veer off into provincial jurisdictions. We don't get involved. We didn't get involved with plastic bags. We didn't get involved with a lot of other things because they were provincial jurisdictions. This is a provincial jurisdiction. As good as it is and as important as it is, we're stepping it outside of our normal realm and putting it on. Does this now make it that um, Councillor O'Brien could bring up uh, something totally different on another um, judicial uh, or responsibility of the uh, province? It, it's a slippery slope once you start on this. So I, I just caution you on, on how we handle this. That's my opinion. Councillor O'Brien. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Your Worship. 
Um, well, I have to say, it is just a letter of support, but I also understand our role as a municipality, and I understand what Councillor Greer is saying and some of his concerns. But if you read the letter, um, it's really about equality for men and women in this. And, and in this letter, it's very clear that women have been not treated as equally in, in, in the coverage. Now, how do we, how do we deal with that? I, I think the mayor has a very valid point that um, do we get involved with something like this or do we perhaps send this letter off to our MLA, Adam Walker, and ask him to uh, take it forward. Perhaps that's another way of doing it. Thank you, Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I won't be supporting this only for the fact that I don't feel it's our mandate to do so, regardless of my personal opinion on it. Um, the, the actual uh, concept of uh, contraception and so forth um, is, uh, goes against some people's religious beliefs. And so I have to respect that. And so I won't be supporting a letter of uh, support in this matter. Anybody else? Yeah, please. Thank you. I just wanted to address a couple of the comments I heard there. Um, we'll just go in reverse order here regarding uh, religious beliefs around contraceptives. It's no one's being asked to take uh, contraceptives. It's just making it more available for it, particularly for those if it's like, if it is a cost barrier to get in contraceptive, imagine the kind of cost barrier you're going to face after people start bringing a child into the world. I think that's why we end up seeing a lot of, you know, uh, struggles with, with families too. If they, if they can't afford birth control, how are you going to be able to raise a child? As far as um, bringing up the uh, Senate to our MLA, that is what this is asking for. It's to, to write to the MLA and asking them to, to uh, you know, lobby for that kind of support going forward. This isn't us particular um, uh, doing that work for him. It's asking them to step into it. Uh, as far as like bringing this on to our agenda too, I mean, we, we brought this correspondence on here. Um, we, we accepted it here too. If we didn't want to entertain it too, perhaps we shouldn't have even brought it forward as correspondence because we don't bring everything forward that gets sent to us either in that regard from different communities. Um, so there was some kind of uh, support to, to, uh, to seeing this. Um, the other thing as well here, um, sorry, just on my mind there. Uh, yeah, but anyways, I'll guess let's leave it at that there. So anyways, thank you for, uh, let me bring it forward. Thanks, Councillor. Any other comments? Call the question in favor. All those in favor? Opposed? It wins in favor. It's carried. All right. It's my turn. That's my notice of motion. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to bring up a, a notice of motion um, for the individual first aid kits for Oceanside RCMP detachment. These kits are, please allow me to put my glasses on, for an officer with items that allow them to provide urgent critical, critical care to themselves or appear in an emergency and before arrival of EHS. All RCMP officers are currently receiving enhanced first aid training on the use of the items in this kit. However, the cost of the, to supply the kits rest with the individual detachments. An individual first aid kit, IFAK, of course you gotta have an acronym, contains critical life-saving items that a police officer can deploy to save their life or that of a peer in an emergency situation. Unlike other first aid kits available to police officers in their vehicle, which are for use on the public, this kit is carried by the officers on their person and can be attached to the load bearing body armor vest. This, critical, this is critical as items in the kit can be deployed by an officer that is alone, injured or away from EHS and requires imminent life-saving intervention. I propose that the city of Parks, uh, the city, the town of Parks, uh, Qualicum Beach, and the RDN share the cost of equipping 
the Oceanside Detachment with these important potential life-saving kits, each party would fund the expense by contributing $3,600. And so I move that council approve the allocation of $3,600 from the city's budget council contingency to equip the our Oceanside RCMP detachment with the individual first aid kits. And I need, are we gonna do this in a motion, a seconder for the motion? We can't, no, we can't do this. This is the first time up. Okay, that's fair. So I need permission from everybody, a unanimous decision to um, entertain this motion. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. So I would, the motion is that council approve the allocation of $3,600 for the city's budget uh, from council contingency to equip the Oceanside RCMP detachment with individual first aid kits. And I need a seconder for the motion. Councillor Greer, discussion. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Your Worship. So my question is, why isn't this covered by the province? The province doesn't cover any expenses for the RCMP. We pay for everything. So they, they bill us. Whatever they spend, they bill to us. Right. Except... Well, as Councillor O'Brien said, why not the feds do it? Well, it's a very valid argument, except that each de detachment has been deemed to be on its own. So uh, for this... And I don't disagree, but uh, at this point in time, at, in order to get them the kits that they need, it's up to us to take to carry it. Councillor Fraz. If we were to equip the RCMP with individual first aid kits, will they be administering first aid to the citizens? No, this, these kits are specifically for themselves and for their peers, and they're, they're designed for their emergency situations. And then if I could just have follow up, how many kits would this be purchasing? That is for, I'm trying to remember. If I may, I believe the total was for 50 and that would be shared split three ways. So whatever a third of 50 is, it's not an even number obviously. So one more than yeah. that. Is this amount being split three ways or is this a third of the cost? That's a third. This is a third of the cost to provide 50 units or 50 kits to Oceanside. It's really $10,800 for all of them. They are, yeah. But if it saves one police officer's life, then it's probably worth it. Councillor Wilson, did you have your hand up? I'm sorry, Councillor O'Brien. Did you? Okay, go ahead. It was just a quick question. What about um, the fire department? Do they have these sort of kits for themselves as well? I don't know what's involved in these kits. I don't. I don't know. They they're trained for for emergency situations. So. And they have their first aid okay, equipment, I think, in their in their trucks. I'm I'm looking at the, the big honcho at the back here, telling me that. If I may, Your Worship, um, in speaking with Sergeant Rose, these are specialized um, items that would be attached to their belt. They do have first aid kits in their vehicles, which could be used for first aid for public or whatever. But these are because they're away from their vehicle; they're traipsing through the bush or you know, in a different uh, environment than not near their vehicles. This is something they would, it's a portable specialized kit with those emergency items that you might need if you're injured or shot or stabbed or something of that nature. Councillor O'Brien, did you have? Thanks, Your Worship. I'm blown away that uh, the, the federal RCMP don't, don't pay for this already. If, as you say, if it's just one officer that's saved, you know, this is something. And it's for their own personal use, and they're they're the ones that put themselves in harm's way every minute they're on shift. So I think this is a, a great uh, motion. Uh, thanks for bringing it up. Thank, thank you. And I, you know, I can make a, a dozen comments here that wouldn't be flattering to the federal government for not funding it themselves. But at this point in time, somebody has to. And, and in this particular case, we pay for everything else with the RCMP, save and accept. Uh, 30% of the costs. So if there's no other questions, I'll call the question. All those in favor, opposed, it's carried. Thank you very much. Um, any other member have a notice of motions? New business, Councillor Fraz, you have new business. Uh, the only thing I wanted to bring up under new business is that at this meeting it was expected for us to um, discuss the 
request for budget consideration for a garbage can and lighting in the Jensen Green Bay Trail by Orca Place. Um, I had spoken to staff there and they were getting back with uh, costing and things like that. So I don't think it's prepared for us to discuss it today. So I just thought I'd mention that uh, for everyone watching and, and for council's benefit that it'll come forward, I think at our next uh, budget meeting. Um, also wanted to just make sure to request staff when they bring back those costs in there too, um, things like uh, the Orca Place clean team, they are right now take care of that the area there. If maybe while we're, I know we're gonna be uh, speaking to them about the kiosk and that, if it can uh, be clarified, is the clean team gonna be um, handling that garbage, like taking it out or, or what's their, their involvement gonna be there? So that's all for new business. We will put it at the top of the agenda for, for the next meeting so that it's there. Okay, all right. Before we proceed to special business, I'd like to remind the public that we will have another special meeting to consider the budget on Monday, March the 29th, 2021 at 3 p.m. Our next regular council meeting will be held on Wednesday, April the 7th, 2021 at 6 p.m. We are now going to the 6 p.m. council meetings. And I need a mover and a seconder to go into closed session. Moved by Councillor Greer, second by Councillor O'Brien. All those in favor? Opposed, it's carried. Thank you very much. Do you want five minutes? We're gonna need five anyways. 